Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 58. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm here with Kyler Cheatham. Kyler, welcome back to the show, as always. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you all here today. Uh, we have a good show for you today, as always. We're excited for our guest today. Um, before I jump into the agenda, though, um, just a reminder that this is the podcast related to everything related to digital transformation, including the people, process, technology, and strategy sides of change. And you can find new episodes of this podcast every Wednesday on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn as well as all of the audio podcast platforms like Amazon, Google, and Spotify, et cetera. So be sure to check us out every Wednesday on those platforms, whatever platform you prefer. And today's show is gonna be a good one. We've got three major segments like we always do. The first section is gonna be on hot topics. We're gonna to cover some trends and inter interesting emerging concepts in the digital transformation space, including some really interesting stuff you've uncovered, Kyler related to Levi's, the consumer product company that's using uh, artificial intelligence, sort of a use case of how it's being used at that particular multinational organization. We're gonna talk about automation in healthcare. We'll talk about uh, some compliance issues that need to be considered as a result of digital transformation, especially if you're uh, in a highly regulated industry. And we'll also talk about the saturation of the cloud. That's gonna trigger some people listening right now, which is hopefully enough to keep uh, those, those people uh, listening to see what you have in store for us there, Kyler, and, and I am curious to hear what you mean about that in particular, about the saturation of cloud. And uh, later in the show, our first guest will be Dan Aldrich from Priority Software, and he's going to be on the show with me talking about some alternatives to common ERP systems. So a lot of times organizations think of SAP and Oracle and Microsoft and some of the big enterprise technology providers and they fail to see or consider some of the lesser known options that still might be very viable or even better fits for them as an organization. So we're gonna talk about what some of those considerations are for organizations that are going through digital transformations. And we'll also just talk about general trends in the ERP software space as well. So that'll be a good conversation we'll have with another industry peer and a veteran who's been doing ERP software and enterprise technology initiatives for quite some time. And then finally, later in the show after Dan, we'll have John Reed from Diginomica on the show. And actually, we're going to play a clip that he did for his podcast, actually. He interviewed me for his podcast recently. I uh, had some great questions about the, the future of digital transformation and some things to think about as you're going through digital transformation. So he wanted to interview me, and we'll play you a clip because he has a, he has a very good style, and, and I enjoyed that conversation, and we had a good time with that. So we thought it'd be good for the audience here to hear as well. But before we get to those guests, what are some of these hot topics you've got in mind for us, Kyler? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, you know, I'll start with our, our big trigger factor here, the cloud. Um, so we recently looked at uh, an industry survey that's um, from CloudBolt, uh, which is a, an industry criteria for cloud um, and a, a different partner that, that measures just overall insights of cloud solution users. Um, and I want to ask you kind of the main question that they found the most interesting um, answer to and see what your answer is. And then we can kind of dig into what the industry is. So the question is, and then everyone too watching in the comments, I'd love to hear your answers as well um, to this question and see if, if we kind of have the same um, overall piece of feedback. So to what extent do you agree with the following statement? In order to realize the full value of cloud, what is needed is an overarching solution that connects all of the various platforms, tools, and clouds and provides clear visibility and governance across it. So you can pick agree, strongly agree, either disagree or agree or strongly disagree. I would say strongly agree, uh, primarily because the um, that's the whole value proposition in my mind as far as the, the cloud is being able to tie together, pull together. Uh, different solutions. So 
I went all in on one extreme, so hopefully I'm somewhere uh, close to the to the the real answer there. Is this a survey, by the way, or is this a series of experts that gave their opinion on this? Um, it was a survey. So, and it was given to a, a specific um, technical executives. Um, so uh, these are you know C-suite executives that took this this survey. Um, so you, I would expect nothing less on you know the the polarity. Uh, you went strongly agree, which is twelve percent which is the second highest category, agree came in at 76%. So what is this basically saying? A lot of it is saying that the cloud has really hit a wall without the integration tools in order to make it most valuable for the business. Um, so we, we looked at um, another question, and this is a, a quote, my company struggles to is achieve comprehensive visibility into cloud usage and spend across all resources clouds and tools. 74% agreed with that. And I wanted to kind of get your reaction to that because we've seen this real huge shift in migrating to the cloud. But there seems to be, once you're there, a bit of a cap or a, you know, a, a bit of a, a, a functionality lacking. And I, I wondered if you could give us your re reaction to that. Yeah, I, I think that that's a common dynamic that we see in the industry. And I, I would agree with the, the sentiment there in that um, there is sort of a limit on the, not the viability of the cloud, but, but the potent, the business value that organizations are actually realizing right now. I don't know that it's necessarily, uh, that that's a permanent dynamic as far as reading, reaching that maximum level of business value. I just think that the software vendors and the technology itself with software applications haven't yet caught up to the cloud. Um, and so we're still sort of waiting for that to fully materialize and mature. So, you know, for example, you look at SAP and Oracle and Microsoft and some of these larger um, ERP vendors that were historically on-prem, they're just taking years, which is understandable. They're taking years to replicate what it took them decades to do in the past. So it's, it's just a matter of time, I suspect, before they catch up and in many cases will exceed the potential business value and just overall appeal of, of cloud technology. So what would you say to those organizations, Eric, that are kind of in this area in which they, you know, they've migrated to the cloud, they feel as though they're getting the most usage that they possibly can out of the technology. What are some options that they could continue to grow without waiting for these additional functionalities via vendors um, to come into that space? Well, I'd go back to that first question you, you, that you covered around the integration and, and tying together multiple platforms and tools and whatnot. I think that is what is oftentimes missing is that organizations view cloud as sort of an application specific decision. So in other words, I'm going to implement product A, either on premise or in the cloud. They don't necessarily think beyond that. So they make that decision to go to the cloud with one application and they might decide that, that that's it. They don't necessarily think about, well, if you have these other outlying on premise technologies, maybe there's a way that you could use the cloud to pull from those different sources. Uh, you also look at um, developments in Internet of Things and artificial oops, artificial intelligence and just different data sources and, and the big data that's out there residing, cloud is a great way to sort of pull that into one centralized place um, to get better analytics and whatnot. So that, that would be my advice is maybe look outside individual applications and look more at your whole technological landscape and ecosystem to figure out where you can get the most value out of the cloud. So the final data point I wanted to discuss with you, Eric, is um, a powerful one, in my opinion, where we look at 88% of IT leaders that utilize the cloud believe that it will continue to become more expensive and less innovative without a more formalized infrastructure from vendors. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, it's, it's a good point because it, the infrastructures for a lot of the vendors are still developing and a lot of them are less mature than, uh, you know, than one would expect. So I think that's a a good point and worth noting. Absolutely. And, and that kind of takes me to um, the transition of the conversation of talking about regulatory compliance and digital transformation. It's been an interesting last couple of years for obvious reasons, right? But specifically for organizations that live in a, a very compliance heavy technical world, when we look at data security, you know, patient privilege. So we look at things like healthcare, financial services, or they have, you know, a Changing, res, re, changing regulations, such as law enfor enforcement. Um, so a lot of these, you know, really influence how the data can be stored, 
um, and how essential data can be transposed between systems or accessed at user levels. Um, so I'm wondering if, if you can kind of give us some best practices when, if you are in a very compliance heavy industry, what are some things you can do to make sure that your digital transformation doesn't hit a huge roadblock because of regulatory components? Well, I guess it's a, it may sound like a mixed answer, but I would say, you know, when you, when you ask the question of, you know, what can we do to avoid the roadblocks? I think, first of all, you have to recognize that they, there may be roadblocks and it may be that you have no choice, but to face some sort of regulatory roadblocks. But I think the key to that is making sure that you have uh, good quality assurance and in, in project governance around how the business processes are defined and how the technology ends up getting built to support those business processes. So if you're a highly regulated industry, you probably want to spend even more time than other organizations defining those processes and those regulatory impacts and the, the processes that affect your overall regulatory compliance. You want to spend more time doing that up front and not only doing that as a transformation team, but also having checkpoints with your internal audit and or your, your external audit firms to ensure that you've got the right controls in place and they have the right processes. Oftentimes, you know, the challenges you face, like with traceability, for example, for a food and beverage company or a pharmaceutical company, um, a lot of those issues that could cause regulat regulatory issues are related to business process or misuse of the system, or we didn't configure the software properly, whatever the case may be. And so it's oftentimes stuff that could have been avoided or can be fixed relatively easily without necessarily needing to put in new technology. So we have a, a large multinational uh, client based out of Europe that we're working with right now that's just starting that process of now going back and trying to remediate some of the regulatory compliance issues that they have from using multiple systems. And so that's that's a challenge to do it after the fact, but something they need to do just because they've grown and they've been using the same system now for many years and they've acquired other companies. And in the process, their processes have, have become a little bit less predictable and there's more variability in their processes and that's creating some challenges keeping a, a pulse on the regulatory side of things so i'd say that you know during the transformation you do want to make sure you build in those checkpoints and the governance to ensure that you have the right stakeholder involvement and buy-in in, in terms of assuring that you've got the right compliance in place absolutely and you bring up a great point when it comes to our global footprint and so when you do have um a global client that has different maybe manufacturing warehouses, those types of things in different areas of the world, I assume they need to, you know, take into consideration those local compliance or regulations um, as well and consider that as a piece of their overall transformation. Yeah, yeah, that's a good, great point because your, your global transformation team may not have a good handle or understanding of what all the local regulations are, which is why you want to involve key stakeholders from each location that you're eventually going to roll out to. Um, now, here's a tricky caveat I'll just throw in not to not to go too far off track here, but oftentimes, you know, there's a fine line between asking the local organizations, the, the local teams as to whether or not they, they sign off on a certain set of requirements or business processes or design specs or whatever it is. Uh, but sometimes people will use regulatory compliance as an excuse to not change. Um, so they'll say, well, you don't understand the Brazilian market or, you know, you don't understand the market in the UK or whatever, whatever country. And, uh, and they'll, they'll kind of use that as a smokescreen for a refusal to change. And so you do have to watch for that and, and not assume that, you know, whatever anyone at a local level tells you is a, is a regulatory issue is going to be acceptable. I mean, you sort of have to dig into that a bit. Um, oftentimes that's where the internal audit group can help because usually they know what the local regulations are and what the controls are that need to be in place there. So um, you do want to you, you identify those compliance issues at the local level, but you also want to dig deep to make sure you separate the ones that are real regulatory issues versus it's just more of a resistance to change issue. Absolutely, excellent point. You, you want to be able to consider that um, across the enterprise, and that's a really good transition to uh, my next hot topic, which looks at automation and healthcare specifically. So obviously we know healthcare has been an industry that has gone through a lot of forced digital transformations within the last three years due to the global health pandemic. We've seen rise in telehealth. We've seen you know um, remote diagnoses, different things that we, we typically would say was a core face-to-face -face environment when it comes to patient um, provider uh, interactions. So we've looked at a, a very interesting case study that talks about the utilization of AI in healthcare specifically. 
Um, and that comes because of this huge gap in healthcare workers' labor shortage, which we know has been a global issue um, throughout the pandemic. So a lot of it has to do with automating processes within healthcare that might have been something that wouldn't be automated. So for example, when you go into an office, an actual system is able to use face recognition to make sure that you are who you say you are and verify your you know, client records that way from data privacy. The thing I wanted to talk to you about in this specific study, Eric, was they um, this study here talked about how healthcare workers can take um, an offshore workforce-based approach, which they've been slow to adapt because of compliance issues. Kind of a niche question, but I was really interested to hear your feedback to see as we move through more of a digital-based healthcare environment, do you think those labor shortages can fill in gaps with that offshore model that we know modern tech companies use all the time? I, I think it can. I think that's something we're starting to see more of in this post-pandemic world is the realization that there's a lot of options out there geographically and, you know, sort of reaching into labor pools that hadn't been considered before and uh, potential outsourcing models that hadn't been considered before. So it's it's kind of an interesting time in the world right now because you have this, this uh, you know, obviously we're a global economy and a global country or a global um, world in, in many ways, but then you, you sort of balance that or you see on the flip side you see a lot of a lot of uh, pushes towards more domestic focus um, you know either political populism which is or nationalism which, which seems to be emerging in some countries uh, as well as just the disruptions to supply chains and whatnot that's causing a lot of organizations to think about moving production back home to their to their um, homeland so I think that's the you know sort of an interesting dichotomy we're in right now is yes you can outsource more and rely on global resources but on the other hand, there's another undercurrent that's going the opposite way, which is moving more stuff closer to home. Absolutely. I mean, and that brings me uh, to kind of my last hot topic of the day or a case study in talking about how Levi Strauss Company, which is a global organization, utilizes AI. And I love that you brought up kind of the transition of different labor opportunities um, in shortage, specifically for technology, because what Levi's has done is said, you know, you don't have to be a very hard skilled technical person to work in the technology field. And we as a fashion company believe technology is a creative force within the design environment. So what they've done is they've really um, leveraged AI to look at the different materials that they use, you know, the, the different ways in which they can be put together, um, the ways they can be stored in the warehouse to optimize any sort of robotics um, manufacturing. They've also looked at, at things like user-based content design. So putting things out on like a, a platform such as Instagram and seeing what their actual customers want, taking that data, then consuming it in a, a different format and using AI to actually create those different um, options in the design front. So definitely a, a very interesting model here. So I wanted to, I, I know you're a fashionista yourself, Eric. So of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to get your um, your just your overall reaction to we've seen things like fashion design and technology really become a, a very lucrative um, and creative and almost beautiful opportunity. Right. And then we've also seen Levi's can now turn paintings into jackets because of their AI technologies, those color matching opportunities and just the overall distribution and, and smart manufacturing. So do you think that's something that we'll, we'll kind of see move into maybe from the hard, more technical side to more of what we would call kind of the arts industry with fashion and being able to sell, you know, digital art online and those types of things? Do you think we'll continue to see growth in those marketplaces? I do. I, I guess I was, I was thinking you might go a different direction or maybe just my brain took me a different direction of what you were thinking, which is I was thinking more about you know, how technology is evolving to address the the uh, the less mundane aspects of, of an organization. So no offense to anyone who works in finance and accounting, but just as an example, you know, a lot of organizations struggle to deploy technologies that can just bring together their financials and the performance management and the accounting GL consolidated results aspect of things. That's just one example. 
and that's a you know that's sort of a fundamental core back office thing that isn't a big differentiator but it's a it's sort of a minimum ante to be able to be in business is you need to be able to do those things and so it, i almost view it as sort of like uh it kind of made me think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You've got, you know, at the base survival level is do the real simple stuff or what should be simple, relatively simple. It is like the, the financial and accounting stuff. And then what you're talking about where Levi's is they've worked their way up to that self-actualization phase of Maslow's hierarchy of needs where now they're thinking about the customer and the customer experience and how that all ties back to product design and um, the sourcing and the supply chain and all that stuff. So they're taking, it sounds like, is a pretty broad based look at their operations and using technology to automate some of those things but it sounds like it's focused on the customer experience you didn't use those exact words and it didn't sound like they use that exact term but that you know is a buzzword that a lot of organizations will use is that customer experience so i think it's a good reminder that technology has a lot of potential that are that's being unrealized by organizations because they're having so much trouble just getting the base foundational stuff in place like your your finance and accounting um not at all. I don't think that's really what you asked me. But no, I, I think that was a, a great evolution of the, of the question because you're you're so right. You know, I think it's just the overall meeting of the ability to understand how technology can optimize your business, even if you're not, say, a, you know, a huge financial firm or something like that that relies on very hard data. This is more within the creative process, and I think you answered that perfectly. I think it's a very interesting um, tie to our our last hot topic and labor shortage. Because what Levi has done is they've made their entire workforce technologists. And I'll just make you, uh, I'll read you a quote from, they actually hired a, a chief uh, AI officer and strategy so that, you know, a new kind of C-suite position that we don't often see, especially from a fashion company, right? But he, uh, he said, uh, you can throw the best data programmers at a problem, but sometimes if you just give non-technical people the tools and language to speak about these problems and give them an understanding of what machine learning can do. There will be so much, there will be so more, there will be many more things that you can accomplish as an organization. And I just thought that was really well said in the fact that, you know, there is a place for maybe those more creative minds within the technology conversation. And that's how we work together as an enterprise holistically, right? You know, you do have hard data programmers and the and mining and those types of bigger technical skills. But then you also have the strategists that understand how to kind of conceptualize and put those into the business to best kind of optimize the experience. So I thought those went hand in hand pretty nicely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you on that. And that's a good segue into to our uh, next guest who will talk further about some of the the trends in the ERP software space, particularly among the lesser known software vendors in the market. So um, we're excited to have Dan Aldridge on the on the show from Priority Software. And really the whole premise or the whole reason I wanted to have him on the show is to talk about how, how many options are out there and how viable some of these options are that are not common household names in the enterprise technology space. So for example, SAP and Microsoft and Oracle are the three best known enterprise technologies, but those are by far those are far from the only three options available to you. So we want to talk about and explore what are some of those other options? How viable are they? What some of the pros and cons of leveraging both a big name vendor as well as a lesser known vendor? And then just in general, what are we seeing in terms of trends in the enterprise technology space? So we're going to have Dan on the show when we come back from a quick break. But first, we'll take that break and we'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control episode number 58. My name is Eric Kimberling, here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. 
as well as all the usual audio podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon, etc. So be sure to check us out and subscribe to the show. Um, I'm excited for our next guest, uh, Dan Aldridge, who is with Priority Software, is on the show. And we're going to talk today about some of the alternatives to big, commonly known ERP systems. And we're also going to talk about just general trends and evolutions in the ERP software space. And really the whole context for this conversation is that we wanted to bring a guest on and have a conversation about some of those lesser known technologies. What are some of the pros and cons? What are the things maybe we aren't thinking about as it relates to these technologies we may not know much about? And how can we selectively leverage those sorts of technologies if and where it makes sense within our organizations? So I thought it'd be great to have someone who also has experience with a number of second and third tier ERP systems and enterprise technologies over the years. He's worked with a lot of different technologies. Um, some are well-known technologies, some aren't as well-known. So he will have a unique perspective on some of those dynamics within the industry. So all that being said, Dan, welcome to the show. Sure. Thanks a lot. Uh, so I am the director of pre-sales and sales engineering at Priority here in North America. I live in uh, outside Washington, D.C. in Reston, Virginia. And uh, I came from the consulting side. I, I've been a consultant in ERP and business management systems for about 25, 26 years. So I date myself um, going all the way back to a company called Bond, B-A-A-N, that, that I started at. And they were sort of the Dutch SAP back in those days, mid 90s. Um, and I worked for them and then I built a consulting firm uh, it, with that product and uh, was my company was bought by uh, Priority in 2016. So I came from the consulting side up until about uh, four or five months ago now, I joined the sales team. Uh, I'd been doing a lot of demos and things like that, but I was director of consulting. So I kind of have a consultative type sale that I do um, and you know, hopefully inspires trust in, in companies that I'm, we're working with the sales team on. Yeah, and I thought that's your background is a good reason why I wanted to have you on the, the live stream and, the, and on the podcast here today is because you've worked with multiple systems that are good alternatives potentially for, for a lot of organizations, good, good alternatives to the big guys, you know, the big SAPs, Oracles, Microsofts of the world. Um, and so that, that background is certainly going to help you. You've sort of seen this, this mid-market space or upper mm -hmm. mid-market market as well. Um, and I think you have some unique perspective there. Um, so that good. Well, well, thanks again for being here. Thanks for that introduction. I guess just to start the conversation here, um, what do you think in general, what do you see as some of the pros and cons of just migrating to one of those bigger known name brands, if you will, those household names like SAP and Oracle, um, what are, what are the pros and cons of, of sort of, uh, going in with those, those options as your, as your vendor of choice? So, uh, Obvious pros would be market awareness, uh, lots of companies, references and things um, where they're running it. Um, they tend to be the larger enterprise uh, guys that have been around since, you know, mid 90s or even in some cases, 80s. So there's a perception, at least, that these are very stable systems that, you know, they've had a lot of successes in the past and, and you know, maybe friends and sea levels tend to favor the big enterprise systems if, if they're larger companies because of reputation and because of success stories. But that's so that's sort of the pros. And then, you know, it's, it's like they used to say about IBM, right? You can't go wrong if you go with IBM. And I think the same can be said for SAP or Oracle. But, you know, reality, as you know, it is is not exactly like that. So there's there's it, the span of it is is potentially huge. The cost is sometimes prohibitive, you know, and you got an on-premise system that gets locked in and things like that. So the the pros would be the name recognition, the lots of successes, but the cons would be also lots of um, instances where they ran long and they, you know, had trouble after they went live, you know, maybe shutting down the business at a very extreme. Right. Yeah, you remind me of one of my favorite counter phrases to the whole nobody ever get fired for hiring IBM or, you know, insert big company name here, Accenture, Deloitte, SAP, Oracle, yeah. whatever. Um, the only problem with that, that is 
you may agree. I don't know if you agree with this or not, but I can name a lot of people that have been fired for <laughs> for picking one yeah. of those big name vendors. So yeah, and they put it on their resume and they move to the next one, right? So <laughs> you're yeah. level. Yeah, and it's it's such a incestuous industry too that you know once you're in a vertical, whether it's SAP or Oracle, or you're working with one of the big system integrators, um, you tend to stay in that space, and so you you, you tend to drink the Kool Aid and perpetuate a lot of the same strengths and weaknesses uh, of that solution. So I, th I think that's a, a good point you bring up there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, um, and I'd be curious too, from the audience here uh, listening uh, with us live, you know, what are, you know, if you've been through an ERP evaluation or if you have experience with systems other than those big names that I've mentioned so far, what are some of the systems you've worked with or, or familiar with? I'd love to hear from the audience here. So maybe just drop in the chat, um, what, what ERP systems are out there besides SAP and Oracle, let's just say. And, and Microsoft. Let's pick those three. SAP, Oracle, Microsoft. I think we all agree those are pretty well-known um, names. But outside of those three, you know, who are some of the other players in the space that we, that you know should be on people's radars? I'd love to hear the audience questions, and um, certainly we'll we'll ask you that same question too, Dan. Um, so, so uh, before I get to your answer to that question, though, Dan, I guess just to to take that previous question one step further, or sort of shift it a little bit, um, talking about instead of talking about the big name vendors, the pros and cons, what about the the other vendors in the market, which is, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of other vendors besides the the three that we mentioned. What are some of the pros and cons of working with a potentially lesser known, uh, but still viable, potentially viable product? Well, the pros are that, you know, it may be a case of just name recognition is not there and a really, really good system. Um, that, that, you know, um, yeah, you just haven't heard of them. I mean, for example, Priority is, is an Israeli-based company. We have offices all over the world and customers all over the world. But in, in Israel, we're essentially the SAP of Israel, if you want to say. Um, everybody knows us. We, we are the majority of the market there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a really good software package. It's we're here. We're all cloud. We do have the on-premise capability. So, um, but uh, we're mostly cloud, and we're we're heavily cloud. So we have global implementations that we want to do on AWS, and uh, you know, implement everywhere. So, uh, with a, a company with a global footprint that's not the huge, and they they can't afford the huge vendors, um, it's a really good option. Very well priced like i said heavily cloud um and that's the way the market's going um really nice capabilities in in the areas of workflow so i i think the ones that are uh cloud vendors a lot of times the workflow is easy easy to use it's very uh low code no code uh type of arrangement you know where you don't have to program like some of the big big ones you have to program those uh, kinds of workflows and things like that so those can be some really good advantages. Uh, and a huge thing is is just time to implement. Time to implement. You know, we're talking two, three months in some cases with a small to medium sized business on a on a good ERP cloud package. Um, so if you're dealing with it because it comes up on the cloud, the versions are upgraded, customizations come along with it. Um, it's it's quite easy to implement. And it's easy to use too. I mean, a lot of the bigger ones are complicated and, you know, uh, busy screens and all kinds of things like that. So it's easier for user adoption. And, and you, you talk a lot about this and, and you're absolutely right in change management is a lot easier with a smaller package, maybe a lesser known package, but a really good solid one. Um, and I think if, if they're running on AWS, for instance, that's the way we run, uh, Microsoft backbone and you don't have to maintain any of the databases or anything like that. You don't have to have a big IT staff. Um, and, and a lot of the users can configure things like reports and workflows and things like that. Simple to use workflow tool is a huge thing. Um, and a lot of the lesser known ones will have that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that yeah, the flexibility, ease of use, change management, all that stuff. I mean, those are really good Good points that, that I agree with um, with you on that. Um, so, what, given that there are these other options in the market that may, yeah maybe they're lesser known, 
but they still are viable and they, they have strengths in many cases that some of the other bigger ERP systems don't have. Why is it that, or that so many organizations get enamored by the big names? Is it as simple as what you said before, which is no one ever got fired for implementing A, B, or C, or is it, or is there more to it? Or would you add to that list of why, why organizations become sort of blindly drawn to those systems? Yeah, I think it's it's references and, you know, they know of other companies that have implemented it and, you know, so they feel more secure in that. Um, but, um, you know, it's not necessarily the case. But I think um, I think that uh, our main issue or the main issue of a lot of the sort of second tier down is that uh, brand awareness. Mm. Simply, I mean, you know, We've been around since 1986, you know, uh, and dominate the market over there. And there's a lot of other, you know, companies also second tier that are like that, you know, that that uh, are just unknown because it's a uh, it's a big deal to uh, have a m massive marketing machine, you know, and and have Gartner and you know people like that behind you in the upper quadrant. You know, it stays pretty stable, as you know. It's mm -hmm. SAP, Oracle, Microsoft, they're all, all, you know, in that top right magic quadrant. Um, and then, you know, maybe the, you know, the second tier doesn't get the same sort of uh, consideration from the big. And, and, you know, when you're dealing with Gartner, you're dealing with uh, larger companies um, that they are only kind of looking at that upper quadrant, right? So they're not necessarily looking at the ones that are even just slightly down. So it's kind of reputation. It's kind of what the analyst firms like the Gartner say about it. And it's just safe, you know, or right. it's perceived as safe, which is which is kind of interesting because if the time to implement is so huge, as you know, the, the things that will uh, dictate whether sometimes whether it's a failure or, or success is the time to implement. The cost can be staggering. Um, and, you know, if you're implementing it in a sort of a modular way, instead of some of the lesser known ones that have the whole footprint, including e-commerce and ERP and MES and all the things that link to it through APIs, it's a, um, it's a much more, uh, it's not a modular approach that some of the big ones take, right? So you, you might implement purchasing and accounts payable, right? But every, the other pieces are not there yet. So they're doing it in phases and, and it takes a long time and a lot of consulting resources. You're usually dealing with a partner, whereas, you know, some of the smaller ones, they do their own implementations that they do their own product development and you get a much more personal experience, if you will. Um, and, and you get care. I mean, we're not, for instance, we're not taking people in the U S we're dealing mostly with our own implementations with our own team. We have some very good partners, some big partners and some small that can do implementations. But in general, we're not taking it and putting it off to a VAR and saying, you know, put it over there and forget it. So right. and, and I think that's it's not just us, but it's it's some of the lesser known ones that really have to prove themselves. They have to have a personal touch. They have to have support that, um, you know, is very uh, responsive and things like that. And, and not pushed off to a VAR, you know. Right. So in your career then, what, what was it that drew you personally to, to the, these non-household name products? Not, not that they're, you know, a lot of people have heard of Priority Software and Infor and some of the other systems you've worked with over the years. Um, but what was it that drew you personally to the, to the you know, let's call it the smaller, not small, but smaller software vendors? Yeah, so it, it it just kind of transpired that way. I mean, when I joined Bond, I, w I was recruited. I got an MBA and I was recruited right out of, of school, essentially. And I had a finance background and I was recruited by Bond. Bond was sort of new in the U.S. and they were sort of the Dutch SAP, if you will. So um, it was they were very exciting. They were growing really fast. Uh, they just landed Boeing. We had Carrier. We had all these sort of enterprise level manufacturing companies. And um, so um, I wanted to join the up and coming one. They used uh, Jan Bond, who's the founder, he always used to say, we're number two, but we're the best. Right. You know, um, and uh, I, I wanted to join the up and coming one. And, and it just so happened that that one was the one. 
Um, and also I'm fascinated and I have been for, you know, 25 years that I've been doing this. I love manufacturing. So I was drawn to their kinds of clients and I, I got to visit many uh, large enterprise customers at that time. And first thing I would do is go to the shop floor. So I was a finance guy, so I did cost accounting and everything. And they'd say, go, go up to the uh, finance office. And I'd say, no, no, I want to go down on the floor and see how you build this thing. Because I was just fascinated with it. And then I kind of fell in love with both ERP, which I you know, still do today, and manufacturing companies in particular. So that's yeah. how I got into it. And then um, so it just so happened that Infor bought... In for global solutions, which is kind of like that next, just right underneath the enterprise, and it's in your uh, in your battle of the titans back back when you were do. I think you still do that mm -hmm. battle of the titans, yeah. So it's like number four, right? So uh, they bought Vaughn, and they uh, they have a product called In for LN, which is uh, strictly manufacturing, strictly enterprise level, pretty much. Um, and I just, I, I developed a consulting firm in that and I grew a consulting firm and I just, I just loved everything about it. So again, they were this next year down. And then finally, when Priority bought my consulting business in 1996, I mean, excuse me, 2016, I get my dates messed up. A couple decades <laughs> after. <laughs> yeah. 2016, uh, I had the opportunity to build another one you know, here in the US. Um, and that was a very exciting, you know, having built a couple of businesses and done exits before. It was a very exciting proposition. And I saw priority as, as this kind of like the bond, you know, it's the next one up and coming, a lot of investment recently. And that was very exciting to me. Right. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back from a break, we are going to continue the conversation and continue with some of the questions that we've got for Dan here talking about some of the common alternatives to the big ERP software vendors. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello and welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 58. You can find new episodes every Wednesday on all the social media and audio podcast platforms. Thanks for listening today. We're in the middle of a conversation with Dan Alberidge talking about ERP vendors and some of the alternatives to the common ERP vendors. Yeah, very cool. And, and you just reminded me as you were talking through that response that, and I hadn't thought of this until you and I were talking just right now, but you know, Bond was at some point, you know, a larger player or a larger force in the industry than it than it is now. And it's just a good reminder that the who we consider the big names, the big household names or the or the the big vendors, that changes over time too. You don't know who the next up and coming yes. software vendor is gonna be. You don't know which ones of the big guys are gonna fall out of favor. I think there's an assumption that, you know, if you're a big household name, you're you're gonna be around and viable for the long term. But you know, we've seen it in technology especially, but even other industries as well, you see that who's big today may not be tomorrow and who's not big today yeah. you know, could be. So it's, it's an important reminder just to not worry too much about that. You know, market presence certainly is important, but what's really important is just the level of fit that the technology yes. has or doesn't have with your organization. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. I mean, you know, the reputation is, is the reputation, right? I mean, you know, there's marketing machines and there's great salespeople and you know but there's you know you have to struggle maybe at the second tier there to get into sales cycles to get into short lists and things right. like that and 
you working with companies that are, you know, you're, you're more enterprise level, but you're getting into the small and medium sized businesses as, as well. And you, if you keep an open mind, which you do um, in evaluating these companies, you can find a really good fit for a company, you know, that's less expensive and, and uh, very uh, forward looking technology wise um, and also easy to implement and lower cost. And, mm -hmm. you know, with the with the cloud you got you got so many opportunities to just uh, to do a global footprint support a global growing business that's also very important because you know these larger companies using different they'll have different erps right so you know different erps different versions different people you know running it um and the prospect of a company that's a second tier company that has a really good platform a cloud platform you know, primarily is that you can do a global business all on the same software and you can use some strategies. And I, I was going to mention a couple of strategies a little bit later on, but uh, there's some strategies you can use to um, in the interim kind of get as many as you can up to the cloud. And that becomes sort of the backbone of your digital transformation. But at the same time, give yourself some time to adjust if you have on premise because I, I know this is something that comes up for you a lot. And I've, I've heard you say that the cloud isn't necessarily right for everybody, or at least not right away. And there are procedures to do lift and shift and things like that, which are really good ones to consider long term. But you want something that was, is kind of kind of unite the systems as much as possible and maybe get some analytics on top um, in the in the interim. So while you're building a, a cloud platform with a maybe a second tier uh a company uh, that in the meantime you can you can just sort of you know gradually do it like in phases right bring bring online a website with e-commerce bring online amazon things like that they can be done in a phased approach but you don't have to worry in the meantime of all these different versions and you know different brands and you know it's it's very difficult to support a global business if, if you have that kind of siloed uh, thing going on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one thing you mentioned uh, just a couple of minutes ago about the, um, you know, name recognition and, and, uh, you had mentioned earlier when we were talking, you talked about Gartner's magic quadrant and there's a lot of CIOs and, and executive level people that will look at those, ma those magic quadrants from, um, from Gartner and reports from Forrester and whatnot. And mm -hmm. base a lot of their decision or, or use that as a big input. But I think one thing that organizations need to do is remember that just because someone's on the top right quadrant of the magic quadrant of Gartner's magic quadrant, uh, doesn't necessarily mean those products are better. It, it may mean that there's a certain amount of money that was paid to commission that study that was paid for by yeah. the softwares. And so you have to look at the game that's being played behind the scenes. So, you know, the industry analysts reports, I don't want to say ignore them, but you do have to take those with a grain of salt because they're oftentimes funded by the same software vendors that are showing up in the top right corner of the magic quadrant. And so you have to, you know, right. just because someone's not in the magic quadrant or not in the top right quadrant doesn't mean it's not going to be a good fit for your, your organization and, and vice versa. Yeah. And also the big SIs, obviously they're, they're biased towards the the large enterprise software because that, that's their their business. Mm. You know, they're in the business of, you know, the Accentures and the Deloitte's, like you mentioned. They're in the business of enterprise software and they have practices in each of those, the SAPs, the Oracles, and sometimes the yeah. Microsoft, but certainly those top two. Um, and you know they're what they're gonna recommend pretty much. And if you right. see uh, and you you see other ratings agencies. I mean, we've been working with G2, for instance, that are that are more, um, you know, kind of newer and focused on reviews and social media mentions and things like that. That can and we've been moving up into that sort of their upper right quadrant, which is called high performers. So um, that's driven by reviews. I mean, you know, in a in a, a next year down system, your customers, if they love you and they love the consulting job that was done, you can move up in the ranks of G2. It's not a pay for play in that sense. It's more driven, mm -hmm. it's more driven by reviews and, and social media and things like that. And the experiences that users have, and we have a very passionate base, you know? So if you, and you'll also hear, if you talk to our customers, 
you'll hear that the consulting job, you know, that that was a big factor and the people they were working with, they trusted. And they were, um, you know, if they're not big SIs or, or VARs that don't really have too much of a connection to the, to the software company itself, then you might have a, a, a more distant experience. It, it's, it's a good experience to deal with the software company itself um, and to have good consultants like the A-team consultants without you know, pushing it completely off the bars. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good point. And it, it's a good reminder too, that there's just a lot of different variables you have to look at, you know, when you're, you're uh, considering whether or not someone's in the top quadrant or, you know, a top ranking, you know, is that the right criteria that's most relevant to your organization too? That's the other, the other factor you have to look yeah, at. Yeah. Well. It's very important. Yeah. Um, so when, when organizations are considering the big options, the smaller options and everything in between, what are some of the key criteria that you think organizations should be using to define what the best fit technology or technologies are for an organization? So I, I think cloud is a huge part. Uh, the ability to um, customize uh, without in a very low code, no code type manner and to have those um, a cloud platform that you can bring along the versions, but still hold on to the the uh, the customizations you've done, and very highly configurable. So in terms of screens, in terms of uh, workflows, uh, a business process management type tool that's behind it is is a huge thing without programming, because some of the ones would have workflow with programming um, required. Um, and the, I guess the, also the consulting that goes with it, the quality and the ability to, um, to have a really good, uh, consulting team is a huge thing. Um, and, uh, the ability to connect, I mean, these days, the ability to connect via APIs and, and have standard connections with different things as part of an overall, uh, digital transformation is, is very important too. So it has to be highly connected or connectable via CRM systems, e-commerce, MES, like I was mentioning, um, so that they have that kind of footprint um, and uh, can be connected and also configured uh, in a very nice way. I mean, you you mentioned that uh, Microsoft Dynamics, I, I noticed you switched the positions there, Microsoft and NetSuite, uh, and the primary reason being it's very customizable. Now that's that's also dangerous in the sense mm -hmm. that you know if you can customize it so much, then uh, you you go down a rabbit hole or you develop a vertical that gets left behind or you're dealing with a var that that only does that vertical. So uh, you need it to be configurable, customizable, very good workflow, very good connectivity, and um, also. Um, See, what was it? there was one other thing I was going to mention. Uh, I'll think of it in a second. But uh, those are kind of the criteria there, right. I would say. Yeah, yeah, that's a it's a really really good point. There's a lot of a lot of different criteria that um, organizations should be considering. And one of the things you you made me realize too is as we're talking or as you were talking about some of the things to consider is that you know, a lot of times organizations focus on what the software or the technology can do and where the, the right fit is with the organization. But for any given product, even if it's the product you end up choosing for your organization, I found that it's it's equally helpful, in my opinion, to, uh, to also understand what the weaknesses are. Not because you yeah. want to doubt your decision or not because you want to create doubt within the organization, but because you have to know what those weaknesses are or what the deficiencies are. And you gave a good example with Microsoft. Um, Microsoft generally... Or, or let me back up. I'm sure Microsoft would say that's a strength is their flexibility, of course. But it, organizations, many organizations view that as a strength too, the, the flexibility of the product. But what they don't think about is, well, that flexibility is good because it gives us a, a certain amount of a leeway in terms of how we can set up our workflows and configure the software. Mm -hmm. But it, it can also get you into a lot of trouble, like you mentioned. So you do have to recognize that there, for every strength, there's usually some sort of weakness that goes along with that. And you do have to understand that because those are the risks that you've got to manage. And so in the case of Microsoft, you know, just to pick on that example, since you brought it up, 
if that is the route the route you take, then let's look at those downside risks of what you're about to jump into because that's where budgets tend to overrun. That's where time uh, projects get delayed. That's where just general risk comes into play. So that's mm-hmm. I, I guess that's another point of consideration too is if you, if you have any sort of option where you feel like there's just all strengths and no weaknesses and it's a silver bullet, then chances are you're just not fully understanding what the pros and cons are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would add to that to say uh, there are certain things like uh, you mentioned in NetSuite, the, the fact that they have sweet success. So these are business pre-configured business models that may be useful, um, but if they're not, you know, con- customizable or configurable, you know, they kind of can be a restriction, actually can be kind of rigid. And the workflows that go with it, dashboards and things like that are, uh, you know, out of the box, great, you know, but the the methodology of implementing using a pretty, a relatively rigid business model, if you're not able to adapt to the business rather than the other way around, then that can be a downside, you know, so you, and you've mentioned that before, and you're, you're very right that um, the, you know, selling a business model is great to get you started. But what happens is you're dealing with a business. Every business is different, you know, mm-hmm. except for finance, which I think they're pretty much all the same, right? But uh, right. It, operationally, every, you know, everybody is, bit, you know, a bit different, right? And um, so if, if, if you have a very rigid business model that you're trying to force people into, um, then that can be a limiting, let's say. Right, yeah. Absolutely. I agree with you on that. Um, what about just sort of a little bit more forward looking here and you, you know, you've, you and I have been around for a while to see sort of the ups and downs and the evolutions of the industry. Where do you see the ERP software industry headed in the future? I know you, you may have touched on a few of these a few minutes ago, but maybe we could build on those or add to anything you'd, you'd, su- you'd suggest are some of the trends within the ERP software market. Sure. Right now. Sure. So, the biggest thing I think with the new generation, and I'm a, I'm an old dog trying to u- learn new tricks, you know, but the the new generation is completely mobile. Almost everything they do is mobile, um, and you know, with factories and things, I'm I'm dealing just mostly with the manufacturing vertical. When you get there, I mean, everything is robotics. You know, it's it's replacing people. People are retiring, um, and then the industry in general is suffering from you know, kind of uh, guys retiring and it, it had been, uh, you know, sort of a male dominated older uh, type industry. And, uh, you know, they need to be more inclusive, I think, of women and minorities and things like that and try to recruit. But um, it also means that the ERP software itself has to be very easy to learn. It has mm-hmm. to be very easy to configure and it has to be mobile. And it has to be, uh, you have to have the ability to uh, configure, I'll call it configure, with things like barcoding, with, um, you know, mobile scanners, with the WMS, you know, guiding them with picking and packing, for instance, you know, automating those processes, automating uh, with machines, with an MES, for example, connecting those things and uh, allow people to not focus so much on learning a big ERP system, but, you know, something smaller that, you know, can be learned easily. And it's almost completely mobile. I see, I, you know, and, and the, the artificial intelligence also, you know, being able to enter things faster, you don't have as many people, you don't um, necessarily want to develop these kind of late, uh, late stage learning on something or having old skills, you, you know, for the millennials and everything, everything's online. They want to just take their phone and they want to scan it, uh, into a mobile app and upload things, uh, to the, to the system through a mobile app. They want to be able to scan to receive something and so on. So it has to be very highly automated and you see, uh, you'll see that, uh, they also need to be connected to e-commerce systems so as people move away from retail stores for instance and they move to amazon so they got seller central 
they want to make a connection with that. So software has to be able to do that very easily. Um, so those are some of the trends that I, I think mm. have come. Got to get those young people into this, you know, get them learning ERP software, get them learning it in, in high school or maybe even, I don't know, it, definitely in high school and, and college to have programs like that. And it, yeah. it, it, it's kind of like manufacturing in general, right? The, the same trend you're seeing is a trend to much more automation, much less people driven um, and learning like apprenticeships. For example, I've, I've been in uh, some of these uh, kind of manufacturing 4.0 type conferences where they talk about advances in manufacturing. But at the same time, the people that work in the factory are not, you know, they're not doing manual labor anymore, right? They're doing things like uh, they need to maintain the robots. They need to program uh, an ERP system or configure an ERP system. Uh, so those are different skills, you know? Right. So traditionally, you know, guys like me, you know, I learned in the ERP software of the, of the past and, and I want to have a business management system of the future and I want to bring along millennials, you know, with right. me and minorities with me. It's a huge thing, minorities and women leadership in this area and, and getting them to learn. It's like the STEM, you know, in, in, a, in a way, you know, we need women engineers, for instance, we need, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, people that learn it early and we need to expand the labor pool and we need to start earlier because we're retiring. I mean, <laughs> I'm not too far from retirement myself, you know, so I need the next generation to come behind me and, uh, and they're going to come with their cell phones and their iPads and, that's yeah. what they're going to bring to the table. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back from a break, we are going to continue the conversation and continue with some of the questions that we've got for Dan here talking about some of the common alternatives to the big ERP software vendors. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello and welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 58. You can find new episodes every Wednesday on all the social media and audio podcast platforms. Thanks for listening today. We're in the middle of a conversation with Dan Alberidge talking about ERP vendors and some of the alternatives to the common ERP vendors. Well, you bring up a good point too, you know, that diversity that you're seeing a lot of the world, a lot of cultures throughout the world that are, are promoting and, and sort of trying to advance that that view of, of diversity within organizations in general, you're seeing that same push in technology. And I, mm -hmm. and I have to wonder, and I never thought of this until you were saying it, but I have to wonder if that might help our industry become a little bit, not, not only diverse in terms of creating opportunities for more people to, to get involved in the technology space, but also to maybe bring in some fresh thinking to where we're not myopically doing the same things we've been doing for the last 20 or 30 years that has led to the same dismal results for these sorts of implementations. So maybe having some diversity and some additional um, brains and different ways of thinking will, will help us get there. I don't know. That's just more of a question than anything. Yeah. And also uh, in, for example, in Africa, you guys are, you, you guys are in Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's wonderful because it's a, an emerging market. They're hungry for it. They, they've been underserved from a technology point of view. Um, and you need things like we, we have a, a offline capability to, uh, to upload orders or to work offline. 
And then when they get an internet connection, they can sync it up to the ERP. So in, in, uh, in Africa, I mean, everybody has a cell phone, you know, and they have cell towers, but they don't necessarily have widely uh, used internet. So you're not going to be all the time connected to a cloud system, right? So you might have right. to enter something offline. But I, but I think the most exciting part of you guys being there, you can start a generation of Africans that, that want to get involved early and we can have training programs and apprenticeships and all kinds of things like that. Because, you know, uh, in manufacturing there, for instance, you know, yeah. when they start it right and, and start it with new technology, but they also have to have connectivity is a huge mm -hmm. part of developing yeah. countries. Um, and how they consume technology. Right. Even more mobile in many cases than, than here yeah. where you are in the U S or here in Europe where I'm at. I mean, it, it's a lot of times those cultures and economies are built more on mobile devices, even more so than, than the rest of the world. So that's back to your earlier point about mobility being a future trend. I, I agree with you largely for that reason. Mm -hmm. Um, here's a, uh, question or, or more of a comment, I guess I'd say that I'd maybe see what your thoughts are here. And this is from uh, Shikar on YouTube, uh, makes a comment, uh, near future likely to be light, agile, modular, and customizable. What are your thoughts there? Do you think that's where ERP software is headed? Do you see exceptions to that? Or what are your thoughts? All of the above. Yeah, all of the above. That's where it's headed. And it has to be that. What about so let me just play a devil's advocate, though. What what about um, a large organization, a Fortune 500 organization, the, the ones that we're maybe alluding to without mentioning them by name, or maybe I was alluding to them without mentioning them by name, the ones that are more likely to go with an SAP or Oracle, or, you know, one of the big names. What about those cases where they're trying to scale or they're trying to create more of a common operating model or they're, they're driving costs out of the organization. Do you still see this being true in those cases or do you see them being more drawn to that, call it the more monolithic way of the, the historic monolithic way right. of implementing technology? I think they can still be drawn to the, the, the right way to do it. I mean, the old monolithic way is not sustainable. At least that's right. my opinion. I mean, uh, you know, you have to move, I think, eventually to a cloud platform. People are not going to have these huge IT groups and things like that and the uh, needing to upgrade the database and all of these things. Um, and they want to be connected to the to the cloud through, you know, just a connection an Internet connection with a browser, you know, as opposed to a VPN, you, you know, logging into various on premise systems that are disconnected. I just don't think it's a sustainable module, uh, uh, model, um, you know, ultimately. And, and also the education plays into that as well, because who's learning as, you know, I'm, I shouldn't mention any particular ones, but who's learning the huge enterprise software packages? And who's right. learning even how to use them? Right. Yeah, I, I, I just simply think it's not sustainable. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and we've sort of exposed over the years, we've exposed the weaknesses and the, um, the the limitations of that model. I think it had its place in history or its place, you know, in helping organizations scale at one point. But now mm -hmm. I think even, even in cases where you do have an organization that's trying to scale up for growth and they're trying to create a common, a certain amount of commonality across the, the operations, I think there's still a really important role for flexible solutions in mm -hmm. that, even if you're trying to create a common operating model, chances are you may want to do that common operating model a little bit differently than the way your peers are because you're trying to be different. You're trying to create mm -hmm. a competitive or whatever. And in that case, you need that flexibility. And I could see a lot of these systems moving more towards what I think you were alluding to earlier in the conversation, moving towards more of a, a platform focused uh, approach yes. versus these are the specific workflows or this is how the software works. It's sort of creating more of an open architecture and creating more opportunities to create, um, you know, an app store or third-party bolt-ons or whatever it is that gives you more flexibility in that way too. So I think it, you know, maybe that's just a different way of thinking or ways we need to think about software a little bit differently going forward. Yeah. I mean, as long as it's, uh, as long as it can handle growth, it can handle, you know, I, I've seen thousands of users on, on a second tier. For example, I think you're probably familiar with a company called Flex, which used to be Flextronics. It's the second mm -hmm. biggest 
you know, component manufacturer in the world, they run in for LN, but they were on bond. And now they run in for LN, you know, uh, pretty much through the through the ecosystem. But um, we found that there were a lot of when I came over to Israel, I, I started the first thing I did was I came over to Israel and I said, can I get a look at, uh, you know, some of your customers? Can we visit some of your customers? And they said, yeah, we we've got this company Flex. And I was like, I just because I had finished an implementation with my old company at Flex, putting in their their financials and their global finance model, including shared services. But that was on in for LN. So I knew that that was the global path. And I said, uh, they said, well, they run they run priority here. So we went over to the plant. And uh, they told the story of, you know, hey, this is a highly configurable system. I didn't, you know, I hadn't seen it really in practice yet. Uh, so they said, this is very highly configurable. So we we tried to go to the other system, more monolithic system, and then they switched back because of the configurability, because of the workflow. A lot of the things that um, the other system didn't have or they were very difficult to to learn. I mean, they just like something was easy to learn and and it turns out it was scalable because they have thousands of users and i said well you know i mean it's on aws it's uh they're just running chrome browser there and you know uh, you know they can just connect up and it's fast and it's configurable and easy to learn or relatively you know uh versus a monolithic one um and they just chose to do that so as, as long as i guess my point is that as long as it's scalable and a second tier system can be very scalable. It's not just necessarily small and medium sized businesses. So you want you want something that is scalable, that is on the cloud, that does allow a global footprint. That's very important too. You know, multi site, multi currency, multi company, intercompany transactions, consolidated financials. All of these things are you know can be had with mm -hmm. a, a second tier system. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. And, and here's a, a question from uh, Third Stage Consulting Group. Um, I know them, by the way. Uh, it's, it's really <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is from uh, our team at Third Stage is asking the question, if young people are interested in this field of, of ERP software and digital transformation, what are some steps they can take to establish a career in the space? That would be a you question, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, actually, now that you say that, it, that is something our team would do is they would try to put me on the spot uh, and ask me <laughs> of our guests that in uh, Kyler, who's our, our marketing person, who's also the co-host of, of my podcast, tends to put me on the spot a lot. So, yeah, I, I can take a shot at and see what you, I'd be curious to see what you think, of uh, Dan. Um, but I'd say that, you know, first of all, you know, the more the more you can learn if, if you're still in school. The more you can learn about supply chain and operations, um, I think the better. You know, that's a really good foundation is just to understand business and understand how processes work within organizations. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be supply chain, by the way. It doesn't have to be manufacturing. Like you and I both have backgrounds in manufacturing, but it could be finance mm -hmm. or accounting or just just understand business. Um, I think that's a, a core fundamental thing. And if you can get an internship uh, at a technology company or with a consulting firm just to learn the ropes a bit, I think that that helps quite a bit. But I, I guess my my main advice to anyone that wants to go into digital transformation, either as a college grad or as someone who's just mid career, or some point in their career, and they want to switch to consulting, I'd say just learn as much as you can about both sides of the both sides of transformation, the digital and the business part of it. Because I think if you can do both, that's a that's almost that's almost a prerequisite or a, a must have to be good at consulting. But the problem is a lot of consultants tend to focus on one or the other. You know, they know business really yeah. well, but not technology or vice versa. Uh, what, what are your thoughts though? What, what do you think it takes to, for a younger person or someone who's trying to switch careers? How do, how do you get into this space? Well, I, I think that you need to, you need to get it early, you know, in, in schools and universities and things like that. Um, and so the learning, the business learning, the, the concepts behind things, like finance, for example, having that earlier um, and then getting the basic conceptual training, if you will, mm -hmm. you know, focusing on that. And then uh, I think it's incumbent on uh, 
you know, organizations such as yours to to develop programs mm -hmm. that people can take earlier. So, you know, start getting into uh, even high school. I, I, I was talking to Kyler. She said the Lockheed Martin guy last week was talking about elementary schools. They're they're going yeah. back into elementary schools. And, and these kids, you got to give them credit for being really smart. And they're very tech savvy. Right. They use the mobile devices. I see them flying around on those things. I'm like, wow. And, you know, they're using they're they're learning Excel and Word and, you know, they're learning all the sort of uh, backbone technology that you need to at a very early age. So I think you can layer in the uh, digital transformation tools. Right. So the ERP, the, the data science, uh, the analytics, the, all of those things at a, at a relatively early age, I, I can see it. I'd love to teach a high school class. In the mm -hmm. ERP software, I think it'd be wonderful. Just go to the, and maybe that's what I'll do in my next life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a lot of people do, and, and that's you know having that sort of experience and being able to take it back to the the college, the future workforce within college. I think is a is a great idea, and it was interesting. If in uh, for those that aren't familiar with the the Lockheed Martin um, guest, it's last week's podcast. We had a guest uh, who is the head of workforce planning and analytics and we talked a lot about how they, they're building their workforce how they manage the workforce um in general but also in a post-pandemic world talking about the great resignation and all the turmoil in the marketplace right now so uh, check that out on, on my transformation ground control podcast that was out last week um you can find that that interview um i believe it's episode number 56 uh, if, I remember, if i remember correctly but don't quote me on that because my memory is terrible when it comes to stuff like that um, but I, yeah, and it was interesting though, to hear him talk about how they're looking at sixth grade on as sort of developing proactively developing that workforce and the skills that are needed to be successful in the future, but also, so they have a work pool that's, that's capable. I, I think it's pretty smart thinking, but you have to have that long-term mindset to be able to think ahead like that. And I think that's something that, you know, our industry that you and I are in could, could learn a lot from that. Mm hmm Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back from a break, we are going to continue the conversation and continue with some of the questions that we've got for Dan here talking about some of the common alternatives to the big ERP software vendors. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling, the CEO of Third Stage Consulting, and we recently hosted our Digital Stratosphere 2022 virtual event it's three days of packed content related to digital transformation best practices, about 16 or 18 different workshops and different speakers that are presenting on different topics, everything you need to know about transformation. The, the bad news is you, if you miss that event, the event's over. The, the live event already happened. But the good news, if you've missed it, or even if you did attend it and you want to see replays or you want to catch the sessions you missed, you can do that now by going to stratosphere2022.com. Go to stratosphere2022.com, register. All you have to do is put in your, your name and email address, uh, just a few fields. You get immediate access to all the recordings. And the recordings cover everything from digital strategy, um, software selection, organizational change, process improvement, architecture, data migration, cloud, trends in the industry, um, how to avoid failure, some of the legal aspects to think about, contractual aspects to think about as it relates to your transformation. All that is stuff that you'll get by registering for Stratosphere 2022 replay. And again, go to stratosphere2022.com and you can listen to all the replays of all the workshops that you might have missed at the event. So hope you check it out and uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you soon. Hello and welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 58. You can find new episodes every Wednesday on all the social media and audio podcast platforms. Thanks for listening today. We're in the middle of a conversation with Dan Alberidge talking about ERP vendors and some of the alternatives to the common ERP vendors. Um, there was another question here um, that I wanted to ask here, or have you answer maybe here, is uh, again from Third Stage Consulting Group. Um, would you stay would you say that the cloud or more open source system would require more internal IT support? And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because I, I, I tend to have a controversial opinion on this or or either that or it's it's just there's no clear cut consensus in the industry on, on this topic. But 
maybe just you know in the context of managing a more flexible product that's either cloud or open source or um, any sort of technology that you know low code is another one where where you back to your Microsoft example before where it's like you have the tool sets and the abilities to change the software does that mm -hmm. create a need for more IT support you know to be able to manage no stuff or what you're no just the opposite okay because you're not with an on-premise system you're you're maintaining everything right you're maintaining a yeah. uh, uh, database for example your networking um customization code all of those things are being handled by an internal id staff and you know in, in a company of some size it's going to be a big one cloud is yeah. taking uh is taking a lot of that out of the picture right and mm -hmm. it, it's all getting upgraded at the same time you know and as long as it's multi-tenant and you're able to um you know connect to that and you're able to bring along customizations for instance and put the power in the hands of the end users the key users and the end users right if you have a workflow tools great example to set up a workflow in in a good workflow system in a business process management takes seconds mm. there's no programming involved in it you say Here's a status and it moves when it moves to this status, send an email, send a text. These are very easy things to set up. So it, it reduces the IT staff. It can reduce it significantly or better yet, keep some IT staff, but retrain them on things that are much more value add rather than coming around and installing somebody's laptop. Right. You, know, you got Microsoft 365 for that. You don't need to you know, have somebody come around and install stuff on people's laptop. What you want is to get the information out of these various systems and um, and train people on more of the high value type activities, right? Um, aligning with the KPIs of the business, being able to see uh, dashboards and, and uh, analytics that are all along the same lines as the, the business needs, right? structuring those things and putting the power of reporting report writer for instance that that was used to be a huge thing when i was at bond for instance you uh, most of the customizations were just reports right you had to write code to get a new report so if you wanted to add a field or something like that that's a whole new program and i would go into a company like uh flex you can imagine they had hundreds and hundreds of customizations and probably close to half of them were reports because they didn't have a report generator in the hands of an end user that could do that it had to be coded so right, right. And, and when you go to the next version every one of them had to be reprogrammed you know right but the, the thing to do would be to give a powerful reporting tool some bi and some dashboard capability which that's what we do. We embed the analytics in there um, and allow an end user to configure their workflow, to configure their screens, to set up role based, you know, role based home pages, things like that with the with the correct flow. Um, and you, if you can do that in a tool that is very intuitive and just say, you know, you, you're you're a buyer, you have all the purchasing things, purchase order, purchase order reports. Just put it on the desktop there and allow them to allow them to work with it without customization. So yeah. um, that should be the goal, I think, is to focus on high value add type procedures uh, yeah. and more of the data analytics. And that's that's also where I think you're going with the digital transformation is you want. And that's also part of change management is when you're retraining people to be even an IT staff, you want to repurpose them away from putting software on somebody's computers to uh, using a, a data, you know, analytics tool to uh, measure the business. Yeah, yeah. So it, if anything, it just changes the skill sets and the focus of an organization, kind of moving from more of a reactive support fix type of mentality to more of a strategic uh, mindset, which I think that's what a lot of organizations want, but repurposing or retooling, reskilling the IT department to not only change their skill sets, but also just behaviorally and culturally. How do you how do you shift that mindset? That's a 
a whole change management undertaking in and of itself. But I think that technology itself, like you said, is is a driver for a lot of those changes that need to happen organizationally. Yeah, I mean, it takes away the drudgery to a yeah. large extent, right? It, I mean, we're all in huge competition now for talent. Mm. You know, you don't want a drudgery job that was the last generation's job, and probably the my generation's job. You want it to be interesting and you want it to be focused on, uh, uh, you know, things that drive the business and allow you to make an impact rather than, you know, entering a purchase order. I mean, I can I can see the day when artificial intelligence will you say create a purchase order and go, boop, you know, put a purchase order in there instead of you having to manually enter stuff and take stuff off of a spreadsheet or take something from email and enter a sales order. I mean, those are all kind of drudgery tasks. And uh, if you have a much more interesting, I guess, or exciting job role, which would be something like uh, an analytics person or a data scientist, you know, those things are being taught in school now. And they're very uh, high value add for a digital transformation, right? You don't want them focused on learning how to enter a PO in, a, in an ERP system. Right, right. Yeah, well, well put. Um, so maybe just to bring this all full circle and uh, to, to wrap up the conversation here, what what advice would you give to organizations that are about to embark on either an ERP implementation and or a general digital transformation? What sorts of, you know, headline advice would you give to those teams and organizations? Um, so I, I would say that they uh, need to be prepared for uh, a change in their business, a, a way to uh, facilitate their business. They need to um, sort of start gathering together what are our processes now and developing, uh, starting to think ahead of um, using consultants or, you know, other resources to help design the processes, the to be processes, and make sure that they have organizational readiness because particularly in a small business, you know, people have their real jobs. I like to say, you know, you got your real job, so you need to be having the resources that can participate in in an effort like that, both the ERP and in in general uh, digital transformation. So you have to have the capability, and you have to look ahead and develop a team. You know, develop a team, and uh, you know, get them ready for the effort, and have the C levels behind it. You know, because if it, it's it's not just that you have to do it if it, it's the shiny new thing, right? It's not that you just have to do it and get something in place. You want to make it strategic to match with the business. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You want that alignment with what you're trying to accomplish as an organization, making sure that that transformation, that technology initiative supports that overarching strategy for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, good. So uh, how can people get a hold of you? Can they, can, what's the best way to connect with you? Is it on LinkedIn? What's your, what's your website address? Yes, the website address is just priority-software.com. Okay. And, and my LinkedIn, LinkedIn profile LinkedIn. is up there. Yes, you're very active. You're you're uh, you might be more active than I am on LinkedIn. So uh, <laughs> you're you're one of my uh, one of my peers that, that likes to post about this crazy digital transformation stuff uh, pretty often. Yeah, I think I think you saw me pop up on the digital stratosphere a bunch of times, right? Yeah, I was yeah. in line asking questions and, and making comments. And uh, yeah, so LinkedIn is a big thing for me. I, I'm I'm there. I'm participating, trying to participate and add some value to conversations about lots of things, mainly manufacturing and digital transformation or ERP so software. Those are kind of my big interests. But I try to pitch in on conversations like I, I saw that thing about customization. And it was just a it was just a statement, I think, mm. just something like you better watch out for customization or something like that. And I saw there was like 500 comments under there. And I just started getting involved in that. And I posted it on LinkedIn. I said, hey, this is a really engaging discussion about a very hot topic. I mean, you know, customization will kill you if you don't do it right. Right. So, right. you know, that experience you you see the linkedin conversation you, yours are great because you have this live in line questions and things and you had an opportunity for us and you're answering them in line which is phenomenal too uh, during that digital strategy 
stratosphere, which I, I thought was fantastic. And I tried to get as much as I could and then just log in and say, hey, I'm here and now I want to ask a question. And I got so many people reaching out on LinkedIn and I was also reaching out to all the people that I saw. And you see analysts coming in there, you see, uh, you know, really high execs that really know this business really well. Uh, you see technology experts, you see just people that are worried about a digital transformation or, oh, my God, this is going to bring a change and I'm going to lose my job and, and things like that. You had those people as well making conversations. Um, and I was really I was into it. You know, I was in there yeah. pounding away with the questions and everything. But I think just uh, in, on LinkedIn is is a really huge thing and to get involved in conversations, share posts uh important things in the industry i share manufacturing i, sh I share erp software stuff um and just be very active and and connect to people you know I, all the people that were on the digital stratosphere you know i was already connected with you for years but you know there was brad feeks there was kyler there was you know lots of really talented people that you had on there and i sent them a linkedin or they sent me a linkedin um, and it's just great to have these connections and have these conversations and share these conversations and reply to a post and say, hey, you know, I have an opinion on that. Right. Yeah. You, you might have some experience that might help, you know, might help somebody else. And, you know, I've been in the trenches for what, 25 odd years doing this stuff. So, you know, some of it just is just experience, you know, and if you can lend your experience on a conversation on LinkedIn, I think it's a great thing. And I love your I love your stream. I love your digital stratosphere. I hope we get back to the time where we can do it in person. Yeah. Yeah. Those you are know, the best. That yeah. would be phenomenal to go back to that. You know, yeah, that's our, 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 our plan. I love Colorado. So I'll see you out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the goal and plan is that we do that in person next time. And those that missed our digital stratosphere event, it was three days of different sessions and, and streams on different topics. You can go to stratosphere2022.com and you can see some of the sessions that uh, Dan was involved with and all the interaction and the chat that happened on in parallel with the actual presentation, I thought was just as valuable, if not more valuable than the speakers themselves. Um, and I actually go back and I haven't watched them all yet, but going back to watch those has been really, really interesting. So you can, anyone can, can go stream it at, at stratosphere2022.com. Um, but well, I want to thank you, Dan, for being here today. This was a really helpful sure. conversation, and, and I'm hope that this opens the eyes to people listening, just to, just ways to think through your options and to make sure you're not, you know, closed off to any viable technological options that might be good fits for your organization. So hopefully, we've accomplished that here today. I want to thank the audience for for uh, all the great conversation here today. Thank you, Dan, for being here. And uh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to have really you. And, great. Yeah, it was, it was super fun. And uh, we do these live streams same time every week. So uh, we'll have our next live stream uh, next Tuesday. And this this interview will become, it'll get edited and polished up. It'll become part of my weekly Transformation Ground Control podcast, which will come out. It comes out every Wednesday, but this episode with Dan on it will be a week from tomorrow. So uh, be sure to check that out on uh on Transformation Ground Control, which you can also watch on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, as well as all the audio podcast platforms as well, uh, like Google, Amazon, Spotify, Pandora, all those platforms. So thanks again, everyone, for being here. I uh, hope you all have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you, see you next time. Take care. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks for being here today. Great conversation and good having you on the show as a first-time guest and hope to have you on again soon. Um, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Kyler and I are going to talk about some of the things we learned from that discussion and unpack some of the concepts that Dan and I talked about. We'll be right back with more Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download 
download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 58. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler, and we just had Dan Aldridge on the show talking about uh, some of the viable, the viable options of second tier and third tier industry niche focused software solutions in the market. What were some of your observations from that discussion, Kyler? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I'm a big fan of Dan because he's always such an, en an engaging um, participant when it comes to our virtual events and always asks great questions as well. Um, you know, I, I didn't know his background was so diverse. And I think that's what, you know, whenever you invite a vendor on the show, I'm always like, whoa, you know, because we typically <laughs> we typically don't um, talk to a ton of vendors just so we can keep our agnostic and independent um, advice for our audience here. But I think Dan brings a different level of that to the table because he does have, you know, such a background in being a consultant as well. So it helps him kind of understand what clients might be looking for. Um I wondered if you could kind of speak to the the brand awareness of these tier two systems. I think, you know, I I just wonder why a lot of times we don't hear of them as much in the mainstream conversation. And is that something that you feel like as we move towards what we just talked about in our hot topics, more of, you know, flexible customer focused solutions? Is that something that you think will change? Yeah, well, actually, before I answer that, though, one just real quick comment on the the vendor aspect or having a vendor on the show. Actually, it's, I'm glad you said that because in the uh, earlier segment or in the lead up to Dan, I didn't mention this, but I probably should have, is that, you know, we are pretty serious about we try to limit the amount of vendor involvement in this show. And, and we, we carefully vet the uh, vendor involvement to people we know. So Dan's only this, this is only the second time we've had a a vendor, a software vendor on the show. The first one was the CEO of Odoo, which was back, I don't remember what episode it was, but it was a few months ago. I think it was over the summer, in the summer months of 2021. Um, and so this is only the second time we've done it. And I always make sure that we're not going to have an overly uh, commercial discussion because I don't want to talk about specific vendors. And he did a real nice job of not talking about his company. It's good exposure for his company to be on the show, but um, we didn't want it to turn into a commercial for any one vendor. And by the way, one last thing, the vendors don't pay. No one pays to be on the show. We we don't make money from the show. We don't uh, sell advertising or anything like that. And that's intentional because we want this to be educational, informative, and not biased by any commercial advertisements or sponsors or anything of that nature. So um, that's uh, just the caveat. So all that being said, now I forgot what your question was. I knew that was going to happen. Maybe just summarize it or trigger it for me or, or yeah, out my memory. No worries. It's there I was somewhere. Just I was at, I just feel like this tier two area in um, vendors is kind of somewhat elusive. Like we, we never mm -hmm. really know um, who they are. And I, I wonder why that is nope. and if you think that will change. Yep. yep. Gotcha. Okay. It's coming back to me now. Thank you. <laughs> so the, uh, no, the, I think the biggest thing is that, you know, the big vendors have reached such mass scale that they have huge, not just huge R&D dollars that they can invest in the product, but also marketing dollars. And so um, I don't, it's not as much the case anymore, but I, I remember for a, a period, a long period of time in my career, because I fly all the time in our profession, um, I spent a lot of time at airports and I remember seeing a lot of ads, you know, just billboards or banners in the airport for SAP. So business travelers that walk through an airport are going to see banners for SAP. Sometimes it's Oracle. Um, I don't see as much Microsoft, but, you know, those two vendors in particular, SAP and Oracle, do a lot of advertising in business centric places like that. They sponsor golf tournaments, stuff like that. So it, it's sort of like, um, you know, it's it's like any any niche versus mainstream sort of uh, conflict or trade off. Um, you know, a lot of these smaller vendors that specialize in one industry aren't going to spend the money to advertise in an airport. Not even not necessarily only because they can't afford it potentially, but also because it's just wasted coverage. It's wasted marketing dollars reaching too many people that aren't their target market. So, you know, you might be more likely to see some of those solutions in more trade journals and targeted uh, things like that. So um, I think it's just an, a good reminder that there's companies out there that are targeting specific verticals and, and different functions. And then there's others that are trying to be everything to everyone and both have their pros and cons as we've talked about with Dan. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, that's a, a great point of really just taking the evaluation process seriously 
when you are understanding uh, the marketing message versus the actual needs of your organization is is really key to making sure that you do consider these these different vendors that might be you know a better option. And then I I like how we also kind of talked about a phased approach um, to a cloud solution or moving to a cloud solution. I think we we talked a lot about at Digital Stratosphere, which you mentioned in your interview. We had you know the lift and shift or the built from scratch. And this one sounded like almost a hybrid between the, the, the two of them, where you really could kind of phase your overall um, saturation within the cloud. Um, and I wondered if you could kind of elaborate on kind of those hybrid options that we don't talk about a ton, but could be a good option for a business that might not be quite ready to completely you know, leave an on-prem solution for the cloud. Yeah, it sort of takes me back to that uh, opening hot topic you talked about related to um, usage of cloud and the integration of different solutions all within the cloud. I think that's kind of where we're at, and that that's a good uh, example of how you can leverage both on-prem with cloud solutions. Um, as long as you're integrating data and the technologies in a way that makes sense to you, I think it, it's perfectly doable. Uh, and it, in not only is it doable, but in many cases it's a necessity because, as we talked about earlier in the show, not all software technologies have fully matured in their cloud offerings. So some, many organizations we work with, especially in manufacturing and especially in some of the outlying functional areas of a business like predictive analytics or product lifecycle management or, you know, some of the non-core ERP types of technologies. In those areas, you tend to see less maturity for, for the cloud solutions and you end up more likely to use the, those as on-premise solutions. So. Again, this is a transitionary period, I believe, in our industry. I don't think this is going to be relevant in a, in a certain number of years. I don't know how many years, but in a few years, it won't be relevant. But I think that that is kind of where we're at right now. Yeah, and as we as we move to your great conversation and great audience conversation about the future of ERP, I have to ask you this because I feel as though I owe it to my, my peers at Third Stage when we talk about uh, open source solutions or agile opportunities and saying that we don't need more internal IT support. And that is something that I know a lot of our clients kind of get within this magical idea that, you know, all of a sudden you're gonna flip a switch and you don't need an IT department anymore. And that just simply isn't the case um, from the feedback that we, that we get. So I wondered if you could play devil's advocate just for a minute um, and kind of explain why you know, you need to consider the internal resources and it's just, it's not a silver bullet type of solution. Yeah. You know, because I think at the end of the day, whether you're going to use more or less IT resources is, um, I don't want to say it's irrelevant because it is relevant. Um, you do need to understand that, but I think it's, it's even more true or more universally true that your IT department is going to be impacted in some way. It may be that you're using more or less resources or you need more or less technical resources, but regardless of whether it's more or less, you're absolutely going to see a big impact to your IT department. And we talked about some of that with Dan, where um, you, you might have to repurpose some of those resources or upskill or, or train them on different competencies that you don't have right now. Um, so moving to open source sounds great, um, as though in some ways suggesting that you don't need an IT department or it's going to become easier. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but the reality is, regardless of whether it's easier or harder to support that environment, it's a it's a different it's it's a different language almost for for your IT department. So they need to uh, you need to make sure you bring along your IT group so they can support it going forward. Absolutely. Well, such a great conversation with Dan, and this is always um, nice to have someone that's really involved in the third stage community and overall dialogue as we'll continue to hear from him in those live streams that you can join us um, at um, at 10 a.m., excuse me, um, Eastern time in the United States. Um, I highly recommend them every Tuesday morning. Great way to kind of start your day and, and network. And Dan also talked about our digital stratosphere event, which is still available. Um, if you go to stratosphere2022.com and you can watch the recordings and continue to network with a lot of those people. I know he talked about the LinkedIn connections that he got, just overall building that peer network is so important. Um, so thank you for that great conversation. I think the future of ERP is an excellent segue to talk to Jonathan because you know he is, um, I don't even know if there could be someone that would be more of a, um, you know, an advocate for clients 
than you. But Jonathan kind of sits on that side of really just just um, pumping through any barriers or biases within the industry um, as well. So excited to hear that conversation. Yeah, he's got a good perspective and uh, something that's very, uh, he's unique. And he's also has a very entertaining, edgy sort of uh, coverage of the industry, which I really like because I think our industry tends to get a little um, stale or stodgy. Stodgy, is that the right word? Well, um, you are in Europe, so I think they say that's, that. <laughs> that's true. I don't think we mentioned it at the, at the beginning of the podcast, but yeah, I'm, I'm in Europe right now. Kyler's in the U.S. as we're, as we're recording this podcast uh, in this virtually uh, global world we're in. Um, but anyway, so yeah, John's a, John's a good guest. We'll have him on next. And actually it's kind of strange because he's, he's kind of a guest on the show, but really I was the guest I was in the hot seat, um, because he was interviewing me for his podcast. So we're actually going to play you a clip from that podcast, um, that he actually published a few months ago. Um, and and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was awesome. And he was kind enough to give us permission to, to sort of play the replay here in our podcast. Um, so we'll take a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna have John Reed on the show. Who's going to interview me about some of the trends and just some of the things that I see in the industry and where I see us headed in the future. Uh, we'll take a quick break and we'll come back with John Reed, who's with Diginomica, uh, which is the, a website uh, that is really good, actually, by the way, before I get too far into it, Diginomica.com is a great, uh, pretty unbiased site, even though they are vendor funded, they, they're, they're good at being balanced and uh, go to Diginomica.com. But we're going to have John Reed, who's one of the founders and key contributors to Diginomica. He'll be on the show after we take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Really excited for this next conversation coming up with Eric and Jonathan um, from Digimatica and talking about just the overall influence of vendors and what different partners can have on your digital transformation. So with that, Eric, I'll turn it over to you. And really, we're turning it over to Jonathan because he is actually um, facilitating this conversation. So with that, um, we'll jump in. How we doing, Eric? I'm good. How are you, John? Good to be here. Fine. This is your first time on the show, but man, you and I go back a long time in this industry. We probably shouldn't even dwell on that at the moment. We'll start to feel ancient. A bunch of old timers yeah. talking about the old days of the industry and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, like back when the classic rock songs that we both like uh, were actually being played on the radio, you know, like it's crazy. But anyhow, oh, we're here to still being played that? on the radio stations I listen to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, all right. So we're going to be deconstructing digital transformation today um, and basically kind of talking about why it so often, you know, comes up short and this is inspired by one of eric's recent blog posts but this is like something that, that you go pretty deep into uh and you've prepared a couple of countdowns for us on uh underrated keys to digital transformation but also keys to how digital transformation falls short so i'm really looking forward to going through those and i'm counting on our audience to uh to poke us a few times uh, during this conversation as well um but uh eric i do want to also give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about your business model, because I think you're doing something kind of interesting because first of all, your your you, third stage is an advisory and services firm, but you you're, you really are independent in the sense that you don't take any vendor money. And that's pretty rare in our industry. And I feel like that gives you an interesting opportunity to, to really provide customers with like, a, a, when you say independent, it really does mean that because you're not taking money from vendors. So, right. Yeah, and it's it's uh, you know our all of our revenue is derived from our end clients who are the people or the organizations that are actually implementing the technology. So most ERP vendors and system integrators and bars, um, 
are getting commission or some sort of kickback from the software vendors, which is a brilliant model on the vendor's part because you get these right. you, you people out there promoting your product because they make money off it too. And so it's, I see why they do it, but there's no one out there representing the clients or there wasn't anyone out there representing the client side of things. And so that's why, that's why we started the company. The other interesting thing about third stage and, and how long has it been around now? It feels like it's been, is it five years now? Uh, almost four. It'll be, be four years in April. Okay. The other really interesting thing about what you do is that if I didn't know better, I'd think you were a publishing company. I mean, you, you proliferate content. Uh, you do a ton of video uh, and you also, your, your blog is extensive. You also have various studies and reports. Uh, I feel like you're drinking my Kool-Aid about how content and, you know, really earns the trust that that is sort of the bedrock of like the modern sales and advisory. Not many people really drink the Kool-Aid that I try to serve up there, but man, it feels like you've got your own recipe for it. Like that must, is that working for you? It is. That's where most people learn about third stages, either through our YouTube channel, one of our YouTube channels or, and or the blogs that we put out. Um, you know, we just started doing it just because, it, you know, what better way to, you know, first of all, it, it, if you back up, I just like to help organizations. I mean, at, at heart, I'm a consultant. That's all I've ever done. I like helping companies. And so that's sort of where it started was really just, you know, putting content out there that would help companies. But then we found, well, wow, this is actually turning into a lot of business for us. So let's do more of it. And so we just sort of cranked it up over the years. Um, the other part of it too, though, is that, you know, what better way to figure out if a consulting partner or a potential consulting partner is going to be a good fit by kind of testing them out and like listening to what they have to say, listening to how they think. And, you know, and if you like the philosophy, great, you're going to want to work with us and you might find that's not what we're looking for, in which case that's okay too. So it's, it's, it is a good way for us to connect with the, the intent, our intended audience, which is, you know, very, very specific. Yeah. We could probably have a long conversation about the content part of that and why that's so important, but uh, it does create a lot of fodder for our discussion today because you, you, posted a year-end blog on what you learned from Digital Transformation 2021 that I'm really looking forward to getting into because it really kind of gets into why digital transformation falls short, which I think is a really, really important topic uh, for all of us in this industry who, you know, I, I'm somewhat something of an advocate for transformation. I think a lot of people like you and me are, but we are accountable for the results. Like if we're going to advocate that, we also have to show that it's working. <laughs> so exactly. that 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 gap there, I think we, we do need to to address. And one, one cool thing about uh, our show today is in addition to preparing some exclusive material for me, uh, I get the chance to dig behind your blogs because uh, your blogs show up pretty frequently in my hits and misses best of the week. But if I ever would, would have a criticism of your blogs, and this is just for me personally, a lot of times I'm like, oh, Eric stopped before he got to everything I wanted to hear from him because you have a very like concise style of blogging, which I think works well for you. And, and I'm probably one of those people that just likes a lot of the meaty details of things. Mm. Um, but now I have you. So now I get, now I get to force, <laughs> I get to force the issue. And I've also, wow. I've also challenged you because I know that change management is one of your big themes uh, on, on why these projects succeed or not, which I tend to agree with, but I've challenged you to, uh, to, to be very specific about what aspect of change management we're referring to. Cause I think, I think it's a really important topic, but it's also, a really, really broad topic. And, uh, you know, so, yeah. so, uh, you know, I want to, I want to see if we can hone in on exactly when we use that phrase, what does it actually mean? So, so I've got, I got you on the hot seat a little bit, but I think you're going to do fine because you've been living and breathing this for a long, long time. So, and I've been watching your show, so I kind of know what to expect. I yeah. Know you, you know, I know, I know your tricks. I know what you're going to pull on me or I think I know. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. And also feel free to turn the tables from time to time. It's totally fair game. Uh, Maureen is asking for the name of the blog. It's uh, Third Stage Consulting, thirdstage-consulting.com. Um, that's for our audio listeners. I'm actually going to paste Maureen into the chat, uh, the um, blog on what, he, what Eric learned from Digital Transformation in 2021. Um, and then you can also derive the, the blog URL from that as well. Uh, so thank you, Maureen. And Maureen, uh, counting on a few spicy comments from you. So I'm glad you're here early. So, so Eric, before we get into the countdown, I, I actually want to get into this blog post a little bit. Um, there's, there's a phrase in here that I really liked uh, that really stood out to me. Whoop, I got to get you, got to get your white paper pop up. Boy, okay, here we go. Okay. Um, there's some really important themes in this blog, but, but there's one quote that I really want to call out here, which is, I'm still surprised each year that goes by 
that we as an industry haven't yet figured out how to make digital transformations more successful. I think until we figure that out, that's going to be a drag on the digital transformation space. Wow. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's just, you know, year end, you know, you know how it is during the holidays, you sort of look back and reflect on, you know, how things went, what you accomplished, what you didn't accomplish, what you want to accomplish in the next year, what you're grateful for, all that stuff. And so that's sort of the mindset that I had uh, at that time. But, you know, looking back, you know, I wasn't just looking back at 2021, I was starting to think back, um, back to the late 90s, you know, you and I started, I think, around the same time in, in this industry. And you kind of think of all these things that have changed technologically, and there's just all these new advancements in AI, machine learning, and composable ERP, and you know all this stuff that is is newer. But then you look at the underlying the surface of how companies try to go through these implementations, and so much has not changed. And it's it's amazing to me that we're still repeating. You know, you see it all the time in the industry. I think you see it too. You still see a lot of these same. Um, behaviors and patterns that have led to failure, they just keep getting repeated by the same organization, sometimes the same people. So it's just fascinating to me that we figured out the technolo the technological piece, but we can't seem to figure out all the other stuff, which is more important than the technology, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Maureen says, I'm oh, still surprised we haven't figured it out. It's a total drag. Crazy. Um, I agree. And Alan is talking about the paperless office. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's funny too, Alan, because the pandemic really exposed us, right? Because we thought we were paperless. And then when we really tried to work remotely, we found out about all the different things that, oh yeah, just one piece of paper. But when you're not supposed to be in your office at all, you find out how important that one piece of paper was. Uh, right. So, <clears throat> but you know, Eric, you, you call into, I think a hugely important point too, because like in the 90s, I wrote, I started writing a newsletter called The Extended Enterprise, and I was so psyched. I was like, it's XRP now. It's not ERP anymore. <laughs> and uh, I was like 25 years early on that. But but I think one of the interesting things is like, I don't think I was wrong that of this notion that we needed to be much more external in how we think about software. And I think if, if you and I were to hash this out, I think that's one of the things we'd come up with is that accountability to external constituents like like partners, supply chain partners, customers, and, and even employees is way more important than just an internal focused ERP project, right? right. But, um, but, but at the time, let's face it, the technology wasn't there to realize what I was talking about. Whereas now I would argue the technology is largely there. I mean, granted, some of the integrations and data silos and stuff are a challenge. But I don't think, to your point, the technology is what's holding us back anymore. And yet, there's still so much struggle on the ground. So I think, to your point, doesn't that really call attention to what we're doing wrong from either a people or process perspective? I mean, yeah, occasionally maybe some vendor oversells some software that's not a fit. But I don't think that's at the heart of the problem we're having now, do you? No, I, I don't. I mean, I think, I mean, I do think, I, let me caveat that. I guess I, I'd say I do think that the you know, sort of like our ability to change is moving at this pace, but technology is moving at this pace. And so the gap between what technology can do and what our ability as humans and organizations to adapt to that technology, um, that gap, that chasm is getting bigger. So so in some ways, yeah, I think it does. Um, I, I think that it is partly to do with the technology in that way. Not that the technology is bad. I think mm -hmm. the, the problem is the technology is too advanced for a lot of organizations. Like you think about artificial intelligence. Um, we're struggling to find some like real meaty use cases of how organizations are using artificial intelligence today to operate their businesses better. We know, we have the vision from the vendors. We know what's possible, but actually getting it in use pragmatically, it's just most organizations aren't anywhere close to being able to use it, partly because the technology is still emerging and also because their data is not good enough. And I don't want to go down an AI rabbit hole here, but I'm just giving you that yep. as an example of how technology is there, but organizations can't seem to catch up to the technology. But I, to your point, all the other stuff is even an even bigger issue. All the people, the human and operational sides of things. Tracy, good to see you. Tracy Webster back in action. Agreed. Great at technology. That doesn't matter if we don't get the process and solution strategy right first. Well, Tracy, I think you've come to the right place yeah. based on the content Eric has for us today. Uh, Eric, so... So tell me a little bit about, have you attempted to quantify like how transformation falls short? I know you do some research type projects. Are you starting to get a sense of, of what these failure rates look like? Or, I mean, failure is kind of a tough word, right? Because sometimes failure is more like just underperforming projects, but. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, I'd say like failure, failure, like the big massive disaster, like Hershey's or um, Haribo or um, National Grid, you know, some of these well-known failures. Th that's pretty rare, to be honest. I mean, that might be five or 10 percent at the most of implementations out there. But you hear about them because they're big companies and it's a big deal when they can't ship product or whatever. The bigger fail, I'd call it the bigger failure is the other 80% or so that are just sort of moderate failures. It's not a total unmitigated disaster, but man, they spend mm -hmm. way too much time and money. They're losing a lot of business value that they should be getting out of the project. Whether or not you call that a failure, I, I guess that's up for debate and it's very subjective, but that that's the bigger risk is that those moderate failures that you don't hear about every day. Great conversation here with Eric and Jonathan. We're so excited to hear more, such great insight. Um, we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling, the CEO of Third Stage Consulting, and we recently hosted our Digital Stratosphere 2022 virtual event. It's three days of packed content related to digital transformation best practices, about 16 or 18 different workshops and different speakers that are presenting on different topics, everything you need to know about transformation. The, the bad news is you, if you miss that event, the event's over. The, the live event already happened. But the good news, if you've missed it, or even if you did attend it and you want to see replays or you want to catch the sessions you missed, you can do that now by going to stratosphere2022.com. Go to stratosphere2022.com, register. All you have to do is put in your, your name and email address, uh, just a few fields. You get immediate access to all the recordings and the recordings cover everything from digital strategy, um, software selection, organizational change, process improvement, architecture, data migration, cloud, trends in the industry, um, how to avoid failure, some of the legal aspects to think about, contractual aspects to think about as it relates to your transformation. All that is stuff that you'll get by registering for Stratosphere 2022 replay. And again, go to stratosphere2022.com and you can listen to all the replays of all the workshops that you might have missed at the event. So hope you check it out and uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you soon. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. Um, I'm Kyler Cheatham. I'm here with Eric Kimberling and Jonathan Reed. And we're talking about um, some interviews that Eric and Jonathan did together regarding digital transformation failure and just overall bias in the industry. Um, so we're going to jump back into their conversation. Yeah, Tracy's actually moving into the solutions part of our conversation, which which uh, I'm going to kind of postpone a little bit, but I will read this quickly. Uh, she says the biggest piece is the appetite for change. It is the consultant's job to position opportunity and help clients think through it and push until they get that light bulb moment. Does that resonate with you, Eric? It does. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and yeah, Alan is pointing out collaboration, lots of tools, but very little in terms of people and process. Yeah, I think collaboration is a great example, Alan, because we're trying to, it's like these Slack channels pop up and we start using them, but we're not even sure how the data in those channels interacts with our core CRM systems and everything else. So, um, yeah. and then uh, Tracy, you're all our people. Tracy, we're glad that you feel that way. Um, and, and, and Thomas, uh, I'm going to be bringing up your post later. So just so you know. Um, I'm expecting you to get ornery in the chat. So just so you know, I'm aware of your post <laughs> and, and the light that you shed on the conversation. So, uh, so Eric, just a little bit more on this blog post, because I think it gets to some, a couple other really important points. Um, you have, uh, you talk about forced digital transformations that can you tell us, tell, tell us more about like, what is a forced digital transformation? Yeah. So there's, there's two layers to it. Um, one is what I think a lot of people have been talking about over the last two years since the pandemic, which is a lot of organizations were, were forced into digitizing, digitizing, man, I cannot pronounce that word to save my life. Yeah. They're trying to go digital. How about that? Yeah. They're yeah. trying to uh, create digital offerings within their organization or, or go through a transformation. And that was because, you know, so many office workers were forced home and they just had by necessity realized that their internal systems wouldn't support that sort of flexibility and that sort of model. But the, the dirty dark little secret, that's another layer of, um, of forced transformation, which I know you, you like the controversial stuff. So let's just get right to it. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the software vendors kind of forcing, um, forcing mm -hmm. their legacy on-prem customers over to the cloud. I think that's forcing a certain amount of digital transformation prematurely in some cases. 
Um, we see a lot of clients where, you know, honestly, we, we say to them, why are you doing this? It, just because a vendor's mm -hmm. telling you, you have to go to the cloud. That's, that's a terrible idea. That's a terrible reason to do it. I mean, if you have other reasons, great, then have at it. But if, if you're doing this only because of your vendors telling you, you have to go to the cloud, um, that, that's a terrible reason to go through a transformation and go through that risk and heartache and cost and all that stuff. Yeah. And I would add to that. I think we're in a, in a crossroads here in the sort of pandemic economy where, Oh, we got everyone on these remote work projects, which was so important for business continuity. So we pat each other on the back. But how much do we really transform our business? How much do we really yeah. change to capitalize on the opportunities of today and protect ourselves from some of the risk? And one of the other things as far as risk factors you go into in the post is, is just how supply chains got exposed as part of this and this ongoing supply chain challenge. And then also the people challenge, which is really important. Could you could you comment on on that because I, th I thought that was interesting how you basically acknowledge like, hey, I underestimated a little bit on on how important the HR piece was. And I really like that you did that and kind of called yourself out a little bit. What, what was your view there? Yeah, there's there's actually a few of them in that blog where it's, it's like I sort of thought maybe this would be a thing, you know, looking ahead in, in my predictions. But then you look back and say, well, I, I was off, you know, because I didn't realize how big of a deal it was in, in the the HR side of it, I guess I didn't realize what I was not anticipating were the the extreme labor shortages that so many of our clients are experiencing. I, I, you know, you kind of thought, you know, coming out of the pandemic, of course, you know, supply and demand sort of gets out of whack a little bit with with the labor force and especially people getting sick and, um, you know, are having to quarantine or whatever. You know, there's things that, that will strain the labor market to some degree, but I didn't realize how, how significant that would be. So organizations that can really keep uh, their employees sticky, keep them engaged, keep them excited, motivated and committed to the organization. That's a that's a rarity today um, just because there's so many people quitting their jobs and moving into different industries entirely or even just quitting their careers in general that um, it's it's hard. You know, the, there's labor shortages all, all over the place. It, I think most, if not all of our clients are struggling with that pretty significantly. And that that surprises me. Tracy and Thomas are having a good back and forth in the chat about whether you need a consultant to drive transformation or, or not, and I don't want to get too sidetracked into that at the moment, but what I will say in response to this chat is I'm a strong believer that you need a truth, an, an unaf un unafraid truth teller as part of this process, and I don't think that's often available internally, so that's mm -hmm. my view on that, but I think it could be internal. It's just it requires someone who has the political courage internally in an organization to call people out and call processes out. I don't think that's always easy to do. Yeah, but um, agreed. So I want to continue to sort of paint the problems that we're facing into a full picture. And we're going to do that through your countdown. And then we'll move on to, to sort of the more hopeful part of like, you know, how we can kind of get things to a better place um, in, in this coming year. Because that's why we're in this business, right? If we were just, just doing this to trash things, I don't think any of us would be employable. So, right. Right. Uh, but, but you prepared a countdown of your top five uh, sort of keys to like underperforming projects or digital transformation failures, however you want to. So, so start us off with one of those. Sure. I'm going to, I'm going to readjust my setup here just so I can. I yeah. Can yeah. And I, I can my... actually expand the screen a little bit to give you a little more room. Oh, great. That's perfect. Um, all right. So how do you, you want me to jump right in start at number five? Count yeah. Down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, let's do one at a time, but we might bunch them up a little bit. So start with sure. one and let's see how we do. All right. And I, and actually, just so you know, uh, John, you, you asked for some unique content and you're getting unique content. You're actually getting, uh, you're getting a preview of a YouTube video I, I filmed that's coming cool. out either next week or the week after. So this is a, something that hasn't been released yet, but it'll be released shortly. So you're Excellent. the first scoop. So, so uh, this is why the top five reasons why digital transformations come up short. And you also asked me to be asking me to be specific and sort of cover things that, you know, you don't always hear about. So that's, that's exactly cool. cool. All right. So number five, uh, bias. So, ooh, tell us more about that. So it's it's you get bias either on the solution or the technology and or the way uh, that solution should be deployed. And so um, there's there's product bias and then there's uh, strategy or implementation bias. And 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 that latter part gets back to the thing I was just talking about about how nothing's changed in some ways as far as how we implement mm -hmm. the same we make the same mistakes over and over again. We, you know, we defer to the technology. We, uh, we assume that we don't need to define our future state because the software is going to do it for us. You know, you make some of these fatal mistakes that were, were happening in the late nineties are still happening today. So that bias is a problem and it sort of creates an 
you sort of have this echo chamber in our industry where all the consultants are sort of doing and saying the same things over and over again, repeating the same mistakes and causing their clients to, to run into trouble. Um, and then the other part of bias is the product or, or technology bias. You know, I, I'm a, I'm an SAP guy or I'm an Oracle guy or gal, and that's just what I know. And therefore everything kind of fits in that. It, it has to fit in that world. And the reality is every organization is different. Every organization has different needs and you have to sort of take the blinders off and, and have an open mind. So that's really what I mean there by, by bias. Does that bias extend to prime vendor bias in a sense of like, in, in your experience with projects, like kind of falling back on like, well, they're already a prime vendor. They're the ones we always work with. So they'll be good for this project too. Do you run into that a lot? Yeah. Yeah. You get that. You get the, um, the, the mindset of no one ever get fired for hiring insert big system integrator name here, whether it's Accenture, or IBM, Deloitte, whoever um, you get that bias too. So executives think, okay, if I hire Deloitte or Accenture, or IBM or whoever, how, you know, of course it's going to succeed because uh, I'm, and it, and it's safe. It's a safe bet. But what we find is it's actually in many cases, a high risk proposition to go with those same, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the same players. Are you able to uh, broach those issues with customers? I know this is a little bit of a, like it's communicating these things is a little delicate. How, how would you sort of help a customer to wrap their heads around a concept of bias? Cause I could see how sitting down with a customer and saying, Hey, I think your bias is getting in the way here would be an awkward way to put it. So how would you put it to a customer? Well, you know, you frame it in the context of trade-offs, right? It, you know, there's never going to be a silver bullet, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's a, a certain type of technology or even an implementation methodology or approach, there, there is no one size fits all answers. And, and there's never a perfect answer either. No matter what you do, no matter what software you choose or, or the implementation timeline you put together, your overall strategy, no matter what you do, it, there's trade-offs there, right? And there's risk. And, and to think there's not going to be a risk or that you have the perfect answer, that's, that's misleading. And so you have mm -hmm. to, so the way we do is we frame it in the context of you have two options here. Like, for example, you could hire Accenture. Here are the pros and cons of Accenture, or you could hire a real solid tier two, second tier system integrator that's big enough, but not so big that you're going to get bombarded with, you know, 50 kids out of college. Um, or you could go with a really small vendor that you have, that's going to work really hard for you. They're going to be hungrier or scrappier because you're a bigger client, but they don't have the breadth of resources. So, you know, you kind of work through those trade-offs and you open up their mind to, wow, first of all, A, I have options. B, no matter mm -hmm. which option I choose, I do have there are pros and cons. And so that's generally the way we do it. We don't, we, I've never come out and told a client they're biased, but you, you sort of, <laughs> you help them come to that conclusion. Like, wow, we haven't thought about these different things. I like that, that view of, of kind of helping someone move them off of a more narrow way of thinking without kind of saying you're thinking narrowly, but just kind of being able to sort of show them what else is out there. And, and I tend to agree too with like specialty firms a lot of times, having this aggressive quality that is worth putting in front of customers, even if they still end up going with Accenture in the end, really good to show them what a small lean outfit of experts can do. Cause a lot of times those are super experienced people that kind of banded together, yeah. Bonnie Duncan Tinder, or this vendor is at the top of the X analyst quadrant. So they must be the right solution for us. Yeah. Bonnie, you know how to stoke things up in here. Yeah. Um, and man, we got some heavy hitters in the chat, which is great. Uh, and, and yeah, I, I think that is a big part of the problem, right? Eric is that we, we, we're kind of, I think a lot of customers and, and people in general in this industry are looking for sort of the stone tablets of like, here are the documented top things, but it's, it's not like that. It's so customer specific in the end and industry yeah. specific. Yeah. You know, I agree with you. And when, when, uh, I don't know if you know the story or not, but I'll tell real quick if you, if, if you can humor me on this, but when I was, uh, when I met my wife, um, she had two young kids and, and I didn't, I don't have any biological kids of my own. So we, we got married and I and suddenly I had two stepsons or two and five years old. And I had no idea what I was doing as a parent. So I read the book Love and Logic, which is about parenting and about giving kids choices and, and uh, teaching them to learn about consequences and living with their consequences. And it was super helpful becoming a new stepdad and kind of coming in cold, not knowing what the hell I was doing as a parent. But I found that it was super helpful in consulting, too, because you, I don't want I don't mean this in a condescending way. Um, but when you're dealing with the executives, a lot of times you have to treat, you have to use that love and logic approach where like, Hey, you own this decision. Like, I'm not going to tell, I'll tell you what I think, but ultimately you're going to decide what you want to do. And by the way, here's what I think the pros and cons are and the trade-offs are. So that's sort of like ownership and accountability is it's, it, that's the underlying thing that we're getting at with this is, is, uh, 
yeah, maybe they're biased. Maybe bias is sort of the symptom we're seeing here, but the, the really underlying root cause is the fact they're not taking ownership of some of these decisions. And, and really what we try to do is empower them to, to own it and be accountable. Bonnie has a stat here, and this came up in my conversation with Bonnie Tinder, the last one. So feel free to check that on YouTube. I don't like this stat, but I, I'm going to be prisoner of the data, Eric. Uh, and Bonnie says that her GSI versus in, independent firm research, she finds no correlation between customer success and size of consulting firm. And uh, I have a hard time letting go of like my romanticization of the small, nimble SI. So this is a tough one for me, but Bonnie, I'm going with, I'm honoring your data and I feel like I have to respect the data. One thing I will say, however, is I would like to see data points on projects correlation with success with a project that also has an independent advisor that is separate from the prime, because I think that's a hugely important part of the equation. And uh, I'll await the data on that, because regardless of the size of the firm, I want to see some independent advisors and consultants involved who are not tied to the uh, financial revenues of the main project. So anyway, but uh, Bonnie, really good point, And you definitely made me think there in our show. So yeah. thanks for that. Um, wow, we got a lot of interesting comments. I'm not going to be able to go through them all. Um, but anyhow, some really good stuff around the experience levels of consultants. Uh, so Eric, what else you got? We, we've only gotten through one. So let's get through a couple more here on your list. Yeah. So I, I'm hoping you like this one, but number four is uh group think. Ooh, yeah. So you get companies that, uh, the internal project teams and even their consultants are sort of with, they're in their four walls or their, or their war room, their project team room or whatever, and they sort of just turn inward on building technology and, you know, mapping out requirements and processes and testing and all that stuff. And they, they lose sight of what's happening outside. Both when I say outside, I mean outside, even in, internally within their own organization and ultimately how this affects their customers and other stakeholders, you know, that are going to be affected by the project. So that, and the other thing too, that goes along with group things, sort of like bias is you start to hear what you want to hear and you feed off each other. Like, Hey, things are great. You know, we're right on track. We're on schedule. We're on budget. There's no risk. We have, we have no, we have nothing in our risk log. Things must be awesome. Everything's green in our status report. And you, you start feeding off that and it creates this, this, these blind spots all over the place where, uh, you know, you're, you're sort of uh, just going with the herd versus really challenging and, and uh, you know, challenging, you know, or what are we missing here? Cause there's always blind spots. There's always risks and, so that group thing, I think, could be pretty. Uh, that's number four on my list. Yeah, and and one thing that the audience might not know about you, Eric, is is he, you've been an expert witness. You've seen a lot of court ERP and uh, enterprise courtrooms where you've served as an expert witness on these troubled projects. And when I when yeah. I read when I read about these projects that go awry, like terribly awry, like the ones that wind up in court, so much of what I'm struck by is how you you're like how far how did you get so far down this horrible path without kind of that gut check moment of, Hey, we're kind of heading in the wrong direction here. And I, I think one of the big things for our industry is to figure out how to have these gut checks that, that create a sense of accountability and, and a more objective report card earlier on in these processes. So we don't get like two to three years because by then you are in court, right? Because by then yeah. it's too late. Yes. And you, you know, back to Bonnie's, point about uh, there not being a correlation between size and success rate of, of your SI. One thing the big SIs are really good at is they are brilliant at making you feel good about an impending train wreck. Um, and I was part of it. I mean, I saw, I had partners I worked for when I was 25 years old and I was like, how did you do that? How did you just convince the client that everything's fine when everything is not fine? <laughs> like we have mm -hmm. massive problems, but the client walks away feeling good. Like, okay, we're, we're we're yellow status, you know, we're, we've got some challenges, but we've got a plan to address them. But meanwhile, be, behind the scenes, you're like, this thing's falling apart. The wheels are coming off, but yet we're doing the CYA thing where, you know, these big SIs, if they've got millions of dollars per year at stake, they're going to do whatever they can to make you feel good and make you feel like, Hey, everything's fine. Um, and that's the other, you know, that's sort of maybe an underlying uh, undercurrent of some of these top five is, is that dynamic with your system integrator and um, not, challenging them enough, which I don't want to, I'm, I'm jumping ahead to another one in my top. Three. Oh yeah. You don't want to spoil your own countdown. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and just real quick on group think, and we'll get to the next one. Uh, isn't part of group think kind of department think too, right? Because I think a lot of these projects historically were too departmentally focused and 
and they didn't think enough about different constituent groups inside of organizations that were also impacted. So that's got to be part of it too. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're just viewing the world in your lens of what I need, what I want, and you're not thinking about, um, you know, kind of the broader picture there. Great conversation here with Eric and Jonathan. We're so excited to hear more. Such great insight. Um, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, Contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. Um, I'm Kyler Cheatham. I'm here with Eric Kimberling and Jonathan Reed. And we're talking about um, some interviews that Eric and Jonathan did together regarding digital transformation failure and just overall bias in the industry. Um, so we're going to jump back into their conversation. Vigorous chat. Nice job, folks. Uh, okay. <laughs> what's your next one, Eric? So number three on my list is trusting the experts experts and probably the qualifier should have in there is blindly trusting the experts. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's kind of building on what I just said about the SIs and sort of blindly saying, okay, they tell me everything's fine. So everything's fine. Or what's, what's just as bad as when you get uh, organizations that say, well, they're the experts, they know the technology. I don't. So we're just going to let them handle this. That's super dangerous and unhealthy. It creates this really weird codependent, unhealthy relationship that doesn't end well ever. Um, and I mean, and I mean, ever um, mm. in, in you, so you have to have a certain amount of internal ownership and accountability. And mm. even if you hire independent advisors to help you with that, you, you need to have someone that's looking out for you and watching uh, the hen house, I guess you'd say. And you don't need the, the wolf guarding the hen house, uh, which is usually what happens with the SIs. And so the SIs tell you what you want to hear. They're playing COIA because they've got a lot of revenue at stake and it just, and then you don't have any ownership. You're, you're suddenly now you're overly dependent on the consulting on the experts because you haven't built the competency in house. So that that's something to watch for is just blindly trusting the experts without challenging them. Hi, Luca. Welcome to the chat. A lot of customers are outsourcing everything and losing control. This causes yes. them to be guided by consult. I think that's one of the huge points that, that you've made today underlying everything is this need for customers to take more ownership of, of, of their own projects. And, you know, and, 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 and part, part of it is embracing that your business and your users know more about your domain than anyone. And right. no, no one can come in and, and tell you that. Um, Crawford's got an interesting comment here coming up short has its roots that there is no education as to expectations across the business. There's a real scarcity of different departments knowing what to expect and demand at any given point in a project, especially when it comes to moving to the cloud. I think, again, you kind of come up with this problem of the not enough ownership, right? And, 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 and where the value of the consultant can be to kind of tell you what else is happening in your industry and where other companies have gone wrong. But in the end, you have to make those decisions and own those decisions, which is a little uncomfortable, right? It's in many ways, it's more comfortable to say, well, I put, you know, I, I don't blame me. I, I, I had so-and-so SI take responsibility for that, but it's like, you no. Know. Yeah. That, that doesn't work long-term. I mean, someone has to be accountable, but to your point about, you know, how these, these big failures get to the lawsuit phase and you read about it and you're like, how did that happen? How did you not catch that six or 12 or 18 months sooner? It's because of that dynamic. I'm trusting the experts. I'm outsourcing this. Um, they're telling me everything's fine. So everything must be fine. Or they, or worse yet, things are way off track, but they've got a plan to get it back on track. Um, mm. If they're the same ones that got you off track, the odds of them getting it back on track are slim. So. Yeah. And, and to me, that's part of the promise of where we can go with this conversation in the next uh, 30 minutes is, is, is how we can apply these lessons with better technology to create more transparency across all of these projects. Right. Because that's this big thing that we need in this world right now is more transparency into 
whether it's our supply chains or whether it's our project management we need to mm -hmm. we need to see those things the technology yep. is there to do it you know Absolutely. but but is the cultural will there to do it that's what we're going to find out yep. all right are we on number two now what do we got for number two in, in the we're on number two and that is failure to see the big picture so in other words we don't we we get myopically focused on the tech stuff and you know building and testing all, all the stuff you can see and touch and feel which is usually the technology but then missing all the other stuff the the operational implications the people implications, the organizational design, whether or not this project and what we're building is even aligned with what we're trying to be as an organization. Uh, is it aligned with the culture of the organization? Is it is it better support our internal employees? Does it better support our customers? Is it making us a better organization? You're kind of losing sight of all that stuff in the name of just building some cool new technology. So that's what I mean by failing to see the big picture. That's a, that's a big driver for failure. And, and just to kind of turn that around, what if you saw a project where there was a tendency to not understand that big picture, how, how would you sort of address that with a customer? How would you help get them on a better track with that? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like your question about how do you tell a customer that they're biased without telling them they're biased? It's mm -hmm. the same thing here. You know, how do you, how do you tell a, you know, an organization they're screwing up or they're missing a bunch of stuff without just flat out telling them? Sometimes we do. I mean, in this case, I think it is more safe, I guess you'd say, to come out and say, Hey, you know, here are some things you haven't thought about here, are the risks. And I think framing it uh, in the context of risk management is one way to do it. And then the other way to do it is just, again, with the trade-offs, like you can keep doing what you're doing. Here's what that's going to look like, or you could do this and here's what, and that's what that's going to look like. It gets back to that parenting love and logic thing I was talking about before you sort of give them choices and you highlight what the trade-offs are and what the consequences and the upsides are for each of those potential decisions mm. and make it their decision. We always make a recommendation. We think you should do it the right, you know, what we think is the right way, but ultimately it's your call. You're the, you're the organization. You've got to live with this. So, you know, we'll support you however we need to. Thomas says not losing the big picture is important. Still one needs to be able to take small steps. Think big, X small. Uh, and, and actually Thomas uh, in the intermission between the countdowns, I want to get into your your piece real quick. So be standing by in the comments. Okay, Eric, what's your number one way that we can get off track in our digital transformations? All right. So if you have like if you had a journal, if you had a, like a professional studio and uh, producers and stuff, they would probably do a drum roll right here. But uh, uh, let's see. Just... I have, I have, I have an applause meter. There. So. <laughs> It's, it's still premature, but <laughs> that's not <gonna> work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, let's see if let's see if you lived up to the applause. I know, no, like, oh, that's, there's a lot of pressure. This might be a letdown. Uh, no, but number one is uh, misalignment, and misalignment being you know misaligned internally. We're not all on the same page with what we're trying to accomplish, and or this transformation, this project is not aligned with what our overall goals and objectives as an organization are. So I'll give you a quick example. Company A is a high growth company. They've gone out and acquired a bunch of uh, bunch of other companies. They're PE. They've got PE money. Uh, they've acquired a bunch of companies, and now as part of their transformation, they need to figure out how do we tie this all together. We've got a bunch of pieces we've acquired. We're all acting like you know ten different companies. How do we start acting like one company? So standardization, common operating model. That's all important to us. But then you go through your digital transformation and you start taking this agile approach where you don't define your end-to-end -end processes, you don't define the common operating model, and you just start deploying stuff. And right there, that's misalignment. You're, you're going this way when the organization is trying to go that way. Your transformation's you know diverging from that. So that that's what I mean by misalignment is both alignment between the project and the overall organization, and also even just internally. Um, ag agreeing on how much do we want to standardize? What areas do we want to standardize? Well, well, that we stopped it. You lost at a good point there because we're kind of in this transition. And I just posted up uh, Thomas's blog post on on the distinctions he made between digitization, digitalization, and digital transformation. And I don't want to get too semantical in our discussion today, Eric. But I thought Thomas, who's in the chat today, made some really interesting points. And I'll just read you a couple of of things. That he kind of goes into essentially that that each one of these is a different level of uh, commitment and cultural sort of uh, I don't know transformation around change. So he says dig digitization, the process of converting analog into a computer readable format to improve existing processes. Processes, in other words, 
Digitization is about doing things better. And then he talks about digitalization, which he defines as creating, is using this technology to create new processes. It's about doing better things. So that's a little bit of a distinction there. Instead of doing mm -hmm. things better, doing better things. And then he says digital transformation is about doing entirely different things. And I think that's, and he talks about this organizational transformation across values, culture, mission, and vision using an outside in view. And in my mind, that's a little bit of an insight on where we get stuck because we tend to view this more like a tech thing. Whereas his point is that the higher level of this is much broader than that. And yeah. I had an interesting conversation yesterday with uh, Qualcomm about a bunch of stuff they're going to be showing at the NRF retail show and sort of the future of retail. And I think retailers are a really interesting example of this, Eric, because how can, how can you have a customer driven transformation if you're a retailer, if your store associates are disgruntled, indifferent, poorly trained, unhappy, and exploited? How can that right. possibly be a good customer experience? And, yeah. and so, so to me, that really calls into question, what are you doing with your technology, right? You know, yeah, buy online, pick up in store, whatever, seamless, seamless. Eventually, we have to interact with people. And you have to start thinking about how your people fit into the picture. And I, and I think some people have kind of said, well, we're just going to automate the hell out of everything. And that's how we're going to solve that problem. But I don't think that works. I think eventually there are people involved in this. You can automate some stuff. But in the end, how, how you treat your people, how you empower your people, and what kind of roadmap they feel they have for their own growth, I think is integral to all of this. And so to me, that that's a real clue as to like how we go wrong with these projects is we don't incorporate all these things. So, yeah. Yeah. Back to that big picture comment. And, and to Thomas's point too, I think there's, you kind of have to view your, call it what you want. I mean, let's just call it a transformation, but it's, it's varying degrees of uh, magnitude of change. Are you just are you kind of just making some incremental improvements? Or are you trying to totally transform your business or are you somewhere in between? And that's another piece of alignment you need to have as an, as a team. Your executives might be expecting this big, massive quantum leap or a true digital transformation, like Th Thomas says, but then your project team ends up treating it more like a, a digitization project versus, you know, uh, something right. more significant. And that there's misalignment right there. So it's a, it's a good point. So now we're we're in the uplifting part of our program. We're actually going to talk about like how how we change things for the better, how we get more products off the across the finish line although tracy webster you made a great comment earlier about how go live and handshakes and smiles uh, you know is not the end of things and uh so so eric let's let's kick into your countdown on some underrated keys because i wanted i wanted you to push beyond some of the classics of like oh yeah of course we have to think about change management and training and, and that's all really important and i don't want to diminish it but let's yeah. hear your top let's let's hear your top five let's start with one of those with underrated keys to digital transformation success well, first of all, I just have to uh, give you a hard time. It, it was very difficult for me to do this top five without mentioning change management. <laughs> now, I, I tried to be very specific. There are some change management themes, but you, you I appreciate yeah, fair enough because you you would already know number one would be change management and be sort of a buzzkill. Of and course. So I think yeah. this is good that you forced me out of my box. So number five on my list is uh, non-traditional technology. And I know I'm starting off with the stuff that I always say is the least important, but this is important. And what I mean by non-traditional tech is that, um, you know, back when you and I started our careers, you kind of had this myopic view of transformation or, or digital projects, which was ERP, um, big single ERP systems, monolithic ERP. And now it's like it, you still see a lot of organizations that are trying to trying to repeat that model or that mindset when there's so many other options out there. You don't mm -hmm. need to just look at SAP and Oracle and Microsoft, for example. There's plenty of other best of breed options out there. You've got the work days of the world, the sales forces, um, service now, you know, some of these niche uh, industry specific or functionally specific providers. Um, and then you also have industry, you know, niche specific solutions as well. And then you've also got like open, open source software. You've got open architecture, different tools to use. So there's just so many options, which can be overwhelming to, to organizations that they end up reverting back to what they know best, which is, well, let me just go talk to SAP Oracle and Microsoft and see what they can do for me. So I think you have to look outside of the realm of just the normal, you know, big ticket ERP systems or enterprise technologies and really think about all your, all the options you have out there. Cause there's a ton of them out there. It's, it's pretty exciting. Luca who confides that he's uh, sorry for the typos. He's typing from the cell in bed. Luca, glad you have joined and I hope to see you in here more often. If we're not connected, send me a, a connection request. Uh, and and also just to mention, uh, I'm aware that my 
my time for the show is unfriendly to European audiences, and I'm sorry about that. Um, some uh, customers have X number of products that do more or less the same things, different technology platforms. And he, his core point is customers have to watch out for license pitfalls. He uses the example of digital access and SAP and on SAP integrations and how Rise with SAP is trying to mitigate and simplify that. Uh, and look on this program, I don't tend to get too far into one vendor or another, but I have done a lot of uh, articles on SAP and Rise on Diginomica. I just did another one. Uh, on the syntax and ASUG study, which you could do a search for that gets into a little bit of your topics there. But I think Lucas' point still stands very well as far as that licensing is a major source of friction and also risk management around all of this stuff. And you do need to understand everything around data ownership, right, which is core to this, right? Who owns the data? Who's paying for the data? Where does the data reside? I just saw this story come up from Australia about how... Uh, it, it was like basically saying that using Google Analytics is considered uh, illegal or I mean, they're, they're still finalizing, but this whole notion of like where your data resides is a really big deal right now. So, mm -hmm. yeah, very true. Eric, number four. Number four. You might like this one, uh, too, John. Uh, this is uh, skepticism. Ooh, and keep in mind, yeah. this is top five things that make the, the underrated keys to success. And skepticism is one. And, and the reason for that is because we as humans are optimistic. If we're effective leaders, we tend to be even more optimistic. And that optimism creates this set of blinders and back to that group think and the bias and you know you, all the stuff we just talked about and the, the things that cause difficulties in projects. So yeah, you, you sort of have to be, you know, for the North American people listening here, people from North America that remember uh, Debbie Downer from Saturday Night Live, you kind of need to be have a little bit of Debbie Downer <laughs> in you to where you're sort of like, yeah, things are great. Everything's green on the status report, but here are the risks or here are the challenges we're facing. Not that you want to be negative, but you know you kind of need that um, sense of reality and you need to stay grounded. And I love it. You need a grouch on your team. This is awesome. Maybe my corp maybe my corporate career prospects are not as terrible as I thought they were earlier in the week when I described myself as unemployable. If, if you need to grouch on your team, like <laughs> I might actually right, have a cor corporate future, man. But no, I, I hear what you're saying too, right? Because there's a tendency to want to have this team camaraderie that's all about sort of this sort of like almost extravagant feelings of constant yeah. buy-in. Whereas to your point, like maybe it makes sense sometimes to pull back and say, hey, why, why are you a little hesitant here? What, you know, your BS detector is going off. Why is that? Yeah, and just be critical and, and challenge you know, challenge the experts and, and uh, ask lots of questions, you know, it, you, it's, and again, you can be optimistic while doing that. I mean, I, I, I use the Debbie Downer example. And if you've seen that skit, she's, she's very negative and she's sort of like a buzzkill. It's just like, everyone's having a good time. And then she comes along and it's like, wah, wah, and everyone just feel, you know, everyone's sort of down about something that's supposed to be positive. So you don't want that. <laughs> I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit when I say you should be Debbie Downer. But you right, sort of right. need to have that mentality of what what am I missing here? Everyone's feeling good, everything's perfect, everything's great, everything's awesome. But I'm if that's the case, you're missing something because there's always some. I hate to say there's always something wrong, but there's always risk. You should have a pretty robust risk log, and you should have a risk mitigation strategy. And if you the thing that drives me crazy is when I see a project like in an expert witness case or a lawsuit where the SI has a risk management log and they they've got like three risks that are just super generic and no big deal at all. It's like, okay, then you, something's wrong. Someone's either lying and hiding the truth or they just don't know what they're doing if, if they've got three really high-level, basic, generic risks on their risk log. So um, I, I think that's just the reality of these projects. They're hard. Bonnie Tinner says, Chief Grouch needed on every project. This is awesome. If someone could endorse me for that on my LinkedIn <laughs> profile, that would really make my make my weekend. A whole uh, new Tracy, advisory, advisory services for you could be provided. Absolutely. There are often political things in play too, says Tracy Webster. If the sponsor at the end of the client is positive, a lot of times everyone will follow their lead. Awesome point. CIOs are guilty of this. CFOs, the executive sponsor is most likely to fall on that track. That's a great point. Yeah, and uh, Crawford says Oscar for Oscar the Grouch for CIO, but voices of seasoned experience are often ignored, and it is true, right? I mean, we can't we can't transcend organizational politics, which is kind of what you've covered a lot during this discussion. Is that you can't always transcend all of that. Um, but what, what you can do is at least challenge it and make make other options more visible. Uh, Oliver Marks, who's a world class uh, analyst and grouch on Twitter, he he's, his comment didn't show up in the chat, but he says, "A, you can't 
outsource the, strate the strategic spine. There has to be a there there. And he says, you cover the marketing spin immediately, but there's a naive internal belief in next gen tech being ultra cool in the way forward amplified by suppliers. So that's a really relevant point there by Oliver, I think. Yeah. So. Great conversation here with Eric and Jonathan. We're so excited to hear more. Such great insight. Um, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Welcome back to Transformation Ground Control. Um, I'm Kyler Cheatham. I'm here with Eric Kimberling and Jonathan Reed. And we're talking about um, some interviews that Eric and Jonathan did together regarding digital transformation failure and just overall bias in the industry. Um, so we're going to jump back into their conversation. Uh, and are we are we number three on your countdown? Number three, we can do this real quickly because I've already uh, already stole the thunder of this one and, and alluded to it. But number three is uh, challenge the experts. Um, it's your business. You know, and I say this for people that hire third stage, hire our company and our team, challenge us. I mean, it's your business. We'll tell you what we think, but ultimately you decide what, what you need to do as a business. And there's times where we make recommendations, the clients ignore, or they say, yeah, we'll take that into consideration, or we did take it into consideration, but we're doing this and here are the reasons why. And it's not our job to judge or tell them they're right or wrong. We'll tell them what the risks are and we'll advise them and help them through that path. But ultimately you have to, you have to own this and, uh, and challenge those experts, especially when those experts have a lot to lose by do it, by not doing it their way. Um, that tells you right there, there's, there's a bias there. There's economic incentive that may not be aligned with your needs. Absolutely. Okay. Number two, number two, I don't remember what it is. Oh, yeah, and this one I, I alluded to already too, and that's risk management, risk mm -hmm. mitigation, being able to proactively identify a risk before they become felt. So in other words, you know, a lot of times companies will will get to testing or training sort of on the tail end of a of a project. And then all these risks pop up and all these things that they should have known six, nine, 12 months earlier. They're just now finding out because they they're seeing it you know, materialize. So um, that risk mitigation and proactively managing risk is very important. One thing I took away from our conversation too, Eric, and tell me if I got this right. It, it seems you kind of have the point of view that that everything has a sort of a risk management set of trade-offs that nothing is exempt from that. Right. Which I think is a kind of an important point, right. That, that everything has a set of pros and cons attached to it, which sort of gets to Oliver's point around next gen G whiz technology that no matter what it is, whether it's 5g or whatever it is you think is going to solve your, your woes in some area, like there's always going to be a set of pros and cons. Right. And so fleshing yeah. those out is a really healthy exercise. Yeah. Yeah. And just knowing, knowing those risks, it's kind of like going in for open heart surgery. You know, you think, okay, I'm going to go get open heart surgery and everything's going to be fine. Well, you know, you still need to eat well. There's a risk that you could die on the operating table. I mean, that that's a real risk and you've got to be the healthier you are and the more you take care of yourself, the more likely you are to not have that be a problem. So it's just stuff like that. I mean, you have to think that these, for most organizations, even if it's a, a quote unquote simple upgrade of technology, it's a massive change. You, even the simplest uh, implementations are pretty significant changes. And, and anytime you go through massive change, that's a big risk to your organization because you're disrupting, whether you like it or not, you're disrupting your day-to-day -day operations. Thomas makes a point, very important advice solutions need to be explainable. I think that's true. And I think you know, in the age of so-called AI, that's getting more intense, right? Because now we're getting to this 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 level where some solutions that are being put into place, uh, it, you, you're not explaining how you get the results. That's going to be a problem, right? So just because you get recommendations on inventory management from your AI system, you want to know why you're getting them, and that's something that that really needs to be conquered in many cases. Yeah. 
Uh, so Lucas says his personal tip is to have three offerings in order to compare dollars, assessments, and time to go live. <clears throat> you know, and, you know, I think one of my big things is like, you know, have a dark horse on your short list, you know, like before you just take your, oh, you start with 20, but your short list always looks the same in the end. It's like, right. keep a dark horse in your short list, you know, keep a real underdog in there. And, you know, Eric, one thing I think is really interesting and that I'm seeing a lot in the cloud SaaS ERP market is a little bit of a shift where uh, some industries that have never really had user-friendly multi-tenant software before, they're bending a little bit on their functionality demands in order to get better software that, that especially younger people want to use. Right. Uh, and, and so, but with the understanding that the vendor is going to continue to much more easily update that software than historically was possible with on-prem, right? And yeah. so, and so now, now that changes your shortlist a little bit, right? Because now you might say, "Hey, let's let this dark horse in that doesn't have all the functionality we need, but we like how fast they're moving and how mobile and intuitive their software is." So, to me, that's part of my recipe for this: is like, don't make your shortlist too conventional. Like, have something on there that's going to give you some curveballs, even if you don't end up going, going with it. Yeah, it's a helpful exercise, even if you don't end up going with it, like you said, because you, you end up seeing what your options are. You, you're thinking outside the box. You're looking at those pros and cons and, and sort of deliberately making those trade-offs. So I, I think it, I totally agree with you on that. All right. Before we get to number one, let's let's leave that suspense for a sec. You, you did another post I really liked uh, towards the end of the year. What is the best digital transformation methodology, which of course is a little bit of a trick thing, right? Because you're not the kind of person who would say, well, you know, this lean six Sigma or whatever, like you're not going to fall, fall into like one bucket, but I thought it was really interesting. What inspired you to sort of compare and contrast different methodologies? Well, actually it was not my idea. I was, um, there's a company we work with, um, that they're, they're actually a VAR, but they refer, um, they refer, any, anytime client needs independent help, they, they'll refer us to them. And the gentleman that, that um, I was talking to was telling me about this client that he's working with. And he was taught, he used this phrase that really stuck with me. He said, it's sort of like the, the, the classic uh, clash of the implementation methodologies. And he was talking about how his client was struggling with that. He, the vendor had one methodology, they had their own PMO, and then the, the VAR had their own methodology. So they're sort of like trying to reconcile that. And so it just gave me, it, it, it just, I just got the idea from him. It wasn't, uh, wasn't my idea. I'd love to take credit for it, but it was his idea. <laughs> so what do you think is the, the benefit of that? Cause I enjoy talking about this cause I've come up with like in, in my little short, short thinking around it, like different methodologies, like you can have more of a data and analytics driven transformation. You could have more of a supplier driven transformation. You can have more of a digital core transformation that's centered around your core processes and you're modernizing your ERP. I think there's so many different transformation models. Is that kind of what you were hoping to accomplish in that post is to try to get people thinking around like different ways to tackle the issue? Yeah. And yeah. And really just getting people outside of the one size fits all silver bullet mentality. Um, you know, I think the, the one that really stands out to me is, is probably the biggest culprit of, of creating problems in the industry right now is agile. You get a lot of agile uh, evangelists that are just passionate about agile and they're all about agile. You get certified in agile and agile on the surface sounds like a great way to counter those big bloated implementation failures of years past. But now, again, all you've done now is you've, you may have you may be solving one problem, which is now it's not big and bloated. It's not moving quite as slow, but now you're moving fast, which is great. But you, you're oftentimes moving, moving fast. You're moving faster in the wrong direction. So mm. is that really helping you in the long term? So that to me, Agile, yep. you know, I don't want to pick on Agile too much, but that's that's one example. Or you look well, at, just, yeah, go ahead. So sorry, Eric, keep going. I was just gonna say, or you look at like vendor implementation uh, methodologies who have their sort of prepackaged way of doing things that it just can't work for everyone. One size cannot fit all. So that was really sort of the impetus behind it. Yeah, and I think one interesting thing on Agile, too, is you have two other problems. One is that the word Agile is used quite a lot now in contexts that have nothing to do with the structured Agile methodology. And when it comes to the structured Agile methodology, yeah. when I talk with real Agile practitioners with a capital A, they often don't have very good answers for me to this day on how to do that across time zones and, and across international projects. Now, it's not that they have no answers, but Agile was created as a whiteboarding exercise with the team in the same room doing sprints. That's how it was envisioned. 
So translating that across time zones is not, right. not a simple thing, actually. So I like what you said. Yeah. Na Nathan Crook, by the way, he likes the dark horse thing. He's made that choice before. Nathan, great to see you in the chat. And Tracy says, oh, my God, preach. Agile is a theoretical thing. Um, faster in faster circles. In circle. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. moving faster in circles, Tracy, probably is not the outcome we're looking for in our projects. But it certainly does uh, make you think you're busy, though, which is like half the battle, I suppose. So listen, we've held off on Eric's number one key, underrated key. So now we're going to do it, Eric. What you got? All right, we're going to. We're going to do it. And uh, again, you wouldn't let me say just change management. So I was try I try to pick something. That's change <laughs> oh, you snuck it but, in. Okay. But very, but very specific guys. So this is change okay. management ish, but it's uh, very specific. And that is, and I've alluded to this on the previous countdown, that's internal alignment. If all you do on your project is you're aligned, you, 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 it may not be the best strategy. You may not have the best implementation plan. You may not have the best technology, but if all you have, if all you have is you, you're all aligned on what it is you're trying to accomplish. I'll take that bet any day over the one that has a better strategy or a better technology or whatever the case may be. So I think just getting aligned before you start your transformation, before you start implementing stuff, you better be aligned because that misalignment creates a bunch of friction and headwinds and it creates a lot of risk, time and money that most organizations don't have. So I'll give you an example, and I'll, I'll pull Accenture uh, Deloitte back into this. You've got Deloitte in, they've got 50 full-time people on your project. And you're sitting there trying to figure out what we want this project to be and what we want to be when we grow up. Those guys are billing whether you're ready or not. And you're not ready if you're not aligned. And so you're you're paying these guys by the hour. The meter is running. And so you're you're ramping up the the cost. You're ramping up the risk. And, um, you know, so that that whole alignment piece is, in my opinion, the most important underrated key to success. And Eric, if you began to pick up on if you were working on a project with third stage and you began to pick up on a sense that there was some lack of alignment as as we put it H how would you go about taking that on well yeah i think you know one of the best ways as humans that we can understand and relate to something as vague and nebulous as uh, misalignment is sort of painting a tangible picture of where that misalignment is so if we can look at operations you know operationally here's where we're misaligned uh stakeholder and organizationally wise here's where we're misaligned you know, executives are saying this, mid-level management thinks this and prioritizes these things. Frontline employees are prioritizing things this way. You, you sort of have some very tangible, quantitative, specific ways that you're misaligned. It's one thing to use the word, uh, a vague word, a vague word like misalignment. It's another thing to say, this is exactly what we mean by misalignment and how you're misaligned. It's sort of like change management. Change management is so vague. I think that's probably why that might be part of why you didn't want me to talk or use that phrase is <laughs> because it's such a big bucket of nothing you got to get down into the, the pragmatic pieces of that, that that are important. Yeah, you did a good job of avoiding my ire on that point. And, and, <laughs> but you're still keeping it in. <laughs> yeah, I like how you you got around my filter a little bit there. And and look, I'm like I said, I'm not I'm not disagreeing with with this change management like being important. It's just like like you know, I think Tracy in the chat talked about resistance to change and marine as well and like you know resistance to change is like a, a core thing here right and you know how how we how we overcome that is a big part of this and one of the things i actually like about our current state you know i think oliver is right that we're still in this sort of shiny new toy thing where there's always some new toy but one thing i do like is that there's a lot more pressure to get users to adopt software now and so there's a lot less of this phenomenon of like oh, we sold a bunch of software and we're collecting money on the licenses, but who cares if they're really using it or getting value out of it? You know, they're paying for it. We're good. Right. We, right. we bundled we bundled it with some other stuff that, they, that they're using. And now like that, that lack of adoption is a real vulnerability, right? And so that gets us back to the change thing, right? Because it's like, well, they're not enthusiastically using this software. So that's a failure. Now that's right. a failure. And so why aren't they enthusiastically using that software? And to me, that's where your blogs come in is understanding that. And, and, and that's why I think it's really worthwhile for folks to engage with your ideas and why I wanted to have you on the show, because you don't just kind of blog different things at different days. You kind of have this whole view of, of the enterprise. And so thanks for sharing that with us today. Absolutely. Yeah. Really enjoyed that. 
Um, I want to give you a chance to plug your upcoming show. But first, Lucas says, I'd love to see 30 participating in a meeting and only three actually work and make the hard decisions. <laughs> um, I, I'm not sure if that was sarcastic or not, Lucas. So I'm going to have to leave you to explain <laughs> that one. Um, <laughs> so tell, tell the folks a little bit about Stratosphere because it is free, right? They can register yeah. for it. So, it so just give us the, like a little bit about that show. Yeah. So it's, it's actually an event. We started doing pre COVID, uh, in person, uh, you know, some sort of a three day session to kind of dive into all the different people process technology components of transformation and implementations. And what we, um, obviously during the pandemic that shifted. And so what we did within 30 days of the, of all the lockdowns happening in, you know, March of 2020, um, we decided, Hey, let's move it. Let's move it digitally and start offering it digitally and let's do it for free. So we just sort of just thought outside the box and just decided to offer the, the whole thing for free to a global audience. And um, so, so that's where it sort of all started. And we've done two or three of them, I think since the pandemic and it's a, it's a three day event. I think it's six hours each day. I, I speak at a few sessions with our, our team speaks. We have guest speakers from outside third stage. So a lot of different viewpoints on, you know, what it takes to make these projects successful. And again, it, the whole idea is to provide a, an event where it's not sales spin, it's not uh, rose-colored glasses spin. It's more of a realistic view of this is what you need to be thinking about as you go through a, a transformation. So it's meant to be educational, cool. engaging, you know, collaborative with with people that are joining. We get a lot of good feedback and discussion from the people that join. Um, so I always learn a ton just from the audience. So um, you learn just as much from the people that are joining the, the event as the ones that are uh, presenting, in my opinion. Thank Lucas confirming it was a sarcastic comment about the three actually working and making the hard decisions. I figured as much, um, but yeah, and that's February eighth through tenth. So yes. um, those of you uh, who want to do that, just just check out the uh, third stage consulting site or just uh, get the homepage. It's right on there, Stratosphere two thousand twenty two. So yeah, I think I might definitely check some of that out. I I you got me a press pass to one of the last years and really enjoyed some of the. The conversations and there were some good customer discussions as well which was really cool to hear the field lessons right because that's we can all learn from those if we don't yeah it never ends absolutely so eric thanks for exclusively revealing this content and having this awesome discussion and thanks this was an awesome chat you guys really came through today made it fun thanks for joining yeah. eric it was a pleasure to have you i'm sure we'll do it again at some point Absolutely. Thanks for uh, having me and thanks for doing the show. It's, it's really entertaining. Uh, I always learn a lot and I always laugh at multiple times, even when I'm not on your show, I'm always laughing at half the stuff you say. So I really appreciate because you just have a unique way of delivering uh, some of these messages. So and you have a cool. good view of the market. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here and great questions from the audience too. So I appreciate that. Well, it's funny because I've been writing about B2B content strategy and how it doesn't have to be entertaining, but I'll admit I do want my show to be entertaining, but, but not not in like a production values way, just in more of like, let's really get to the heart of things together. And yeah, uh, and and thanks everyone. You you guys were just fabulous in the chat today. So you, you really you made us all better with your comments. Excellent dialogue between Jonathan Reed and Eric Kimberling talking about all things digital transformation. Um, we are excited to get back and debrief this with Eric and myself. Um, thank you so much, Jonathan, for being on the show. If you don't follow his YouTube channel, we highly recommend it great partner and overall great industry insight when it comes to the content he produces. So with that, um, let's jump back in, Eric, and kind of dissect that overall conversation. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling, the CEO of Third Stage Consulting, and we recently hosted our Digital Stratosphere 2022 virtual event. It's three days of packed content related to digital transformation best practices about 16 or 18 different workshops and different speakers that are presenting on different topics, everything you need to know about transformation. The, the bad news is you, if you miss that event, the event's over. The, the live event already happened. But the good news, if you've missed it, or even if you did attend it and you want to see replays or you want to catch the sessions you missed, you can do that now by going to stratosphere2022.com. Go to stratosphere2022.com, register. All you have to do is put in your, your name and email address, uh, just a few fields, you get immediate access to all the recordings and the recordings cover everything from digital strategy, um, software selection, organizational change, process improvement, architecture, data migration, cloud, trends in the industry, um, how to avoid failure, some of the legal aspects to think about, contractual aspects to think about as it relates to your transformation, 
All that is stuff that you'll get by registering for Stratosphere 2022 Replay. And again, go to stratosphere2022.com and you can listen to all the replays of all the workshops that you might have missed at the event. So hope you check it out and uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you soon. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 58. My name is Eric. I'm here with Kyler. We just had John Reed interviewing me for his podcast. What were some of your uh, observations of seeing me in the hot seat there, Kyler? Yeah, you know, my favorite. I, I love to, you know, put you on the spot and, and see what great insight we can garner. And I know Jonathan. You, you're just disappointed that you weren't able, you weren't yeah, the one to do it for once. I'm just <laughs> jealous that Jonathan is better at it than you know. <laughs> but he does. He brings um, such a great, I think, energy to the overall conversation. Um, and I, I do think it's important what he was talking about, you know, um, in why do transformations fail and understanding that the real key there is the business needs and not letting someone else tell you what your business needs are. So, you know, I sit in the backseat to a lot of client work here. My job at third stage is to bring clients to the table and bring our mission and voice to our overall audience. So I don't, you know, engage in a ton of the day-to-day client work. But what I do hear a lot of times is, businesses um, looking to third stage to do things like create a business case or to define what their goals should be. And I wonder, as you talk to this conversation, how you advise those businesses to really take ownership over their project and explain to them that if they don't, somebody else will, and it won't go well for them. Yeah, that's a good question. Because as you were saying that, I was thinking, well, they, a lot of people want to hear that that there's a there's even an option on the table that they don't have to, um, and you know I, I think it, the hard part. I mean, there is. I have no idea. Well, yeah, I mean, they, there is an option. I mean, you, and a lot of organizations demonstrate that every day. But the problem is, as you allude to, there's uh, there's an inherent flaw in that model where if you don't own the project, to your point, someone else is going to make decisions for you, and it's it's a lot like guesswork. You're going to be shooting in the dark and hoping that those people that are filling the void for you outside your organization, people that don't know your organization as well as you do. They don't know your strategy as well as you do. You don't want those people making those decisions for you. Uh, but it's hard to explain to organizations and teams and executives what what that means. And, and what it means is you have misalignment between your technology deployment and your overall business strategy. And when you have misalignment, it doesn't matter how great the, the uh, technology was designed and built and deployed it's not going to succeed because it's not aligned with who you are as an organization or what you're trying to accomplish. And in the off chance that you just happen to get out of that implementation unscathed and it wasn't a complete unmitigated disaster, then the other even bigger risk is that you're not getting the business value uh, out of the technology. You're not getting what you expected from the technology. So there's really two sort of layers of risk there. And, you know, I put the odds at, you know, 90%, 95% plus likelihood of failure if you don't uh, take ownership of the project and you don't, uh, or if, if you don't avoid that dynamic of just sort of letting someone else take over for you or taking that outsource mentality that someone else is just going to manage the entire thing for you. Right. And I, I like how you and Jonathan often talk about in the industry, the, the quote unquote best practice talk track from vendors of saying like, this is a best practice. And a lot of times you have to kind of drill down to, is that actual sales language or is it a best practice that's most efficient for them, or is it something that you should consider? Um, and it made me think of another um, client case study we've been working on here at Third Stage. Is a lot of our small to medium sized businesses, you know, budget is a big thing for them, and sometimes it's hard to um, identify the value of a third party consultant, even though we know that that's going to make sure that they have any gaps within their their internal knowledge and really an investment to success. It's very similar to change management, right? Um, but it's hard sometimes to quantify. We recently had a client, client that we took through a selection and they decided they wanted to do their implementation themselves, which you know is totally their prerogative. We just give them our best practices and our advice to say, you know, this is the best way to go about that. And then they came back to us a couple weeks later saying, you know, I'm involved with this vendor and I have no idea what they're asking me for when it comes to implementation. And then we, you know, get involved again and get our, our partners involved um, as well. And I just wonder when it comes to looking at those types of objections 
when thinking about a vendor can come in and kind of swoop down and almost knowledge vomit, if you will, um, all of these these different aspects that maybe a business doesn't understand. You know, how do you go in there and help uh, these organizations see the investment in the opportunity of having someone that kind of speaks their language, so to say? Yeah, so I think the key is to, you know, first of all, educate your team as early on as possible um, so that they can be somewhat at the same level with the outside partners. So that's a role we will play with clients oftentimes is just making sure that they, they're not going to become experts overnight in something that they don't do every day, but you can at least educate and get people up to speed and get people aligned on what the project's going to be and what their role is going to be and what they need to know, what skills they need to develop as the implementation is going. If you do that, then suddenly you're in control. Now you are empowered to, to manage those system integrators and those third-party consultants in a way that you wouldn't have otherwise. So it sort of levels that playing field. So that's, that's probably the biggest thing that we do to help enable that sort of thing. I almost see it, and this might sound kind of out there, but as like a, a parent-child relationship, like, you know, you have this child, which is the organization that's kind of out in this big, scary world, and they're being influenced by, you know, things that aren't healthy choices, you know, smoking cigarettes or something like that. And then third stage is the parent comes in and is like, no, that's not something you should do. Stop tobacco companies, you know, <laughs> type of thing. So it's just a, an interesting relationship that I feel like John really understands how it can go wrong. And I think that's why this failure piece is really something that if I were an organization going through a digital transformation, I would listen to that recording over and over and over again and just grab all of the key insights just to make sure that you understand what roles a vendor can Jedi mind trick you into doing. And then all of a sudden you're with a software that doesn't work as well. Um, you know, Marcus Harris always says it great. Software works. It's always going to work. Well, good. Well, that's a good, probably a good place to, to leave it. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, Leave it at that, and there's a lot more we could unpack there, but that is a good conversation with John, and he's got some good insights. And again, you can learn more about him and his organization or his publication at diginomica.com, which is spelled D-I-G-O-N-I-M-C-A.com. Uh, so be sure to check that out. And um, I agree with you, by the way, listening to that interview, if you're about to go through a transformation or if you know someone that's about to go through a transformation or a peer that's going through a project with you, um, I would be sure to share that that interview with with them because I think it's a good conversation for especially for those about to start. So I want to thank you, uh, Kyler, for all your help today and for co-hosting as always. And thank you to the audience for uh, being here and for the, the great questions throughout the discussion here. We put out new episodes every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, as well as all the audio podcast platforms. So be sure to like us, subscribe to us, leave us comments, feedback on the show. We'd love to hear your feedback there. So thanks everyone for being here. Have a great week and we'll see you next week on Transformation Ground Control.